Welcome back to Comic Book News. Today, I've got a really special treat. I'm going to interview one of my heroes from the 80s era of the Marvel Universe. We're going to talk to Elliot R. Brown, a name you may not be familiar with, but I'll bet you're familiar with his work. If you've ever read the handbook to the Marvel Universe and seen things like Daredevil's apartment schematics, uh, the plans to Falcon's wings or Deathlock's gun, or especially to the Punisher's battle van, then you know the amazingly detailed technical illustrations of Mr. Elliot R. Brown. But did you know, not only did he create these amazing diagrams, he's also created some really unique full-length comics, including what is probably my all-time favorite Punisher comic series, The Punisher Armory. We're going to go into his entire career at Marvel Comics, the creation of the Marvel Handbook, the Punisher Armory, and so much more today on Comic Book News. So let's get locked and loaded and talk to Elliot R. Brown. Elliot we Brown, welcome, welcome to the show. <laughs> okay, thank you. I'm glad to be here. It's a pleasure to be in the cramped quarters of the Punisher van. <laughs> I, I often... Wanted to know what it would be like with people in the way. Now right, know. you know, it seems like there's a lot of equipment going on in here. The minigun and all this stuff. Uh, yeah. Although this is from an earlier age, but I don't want to jump into Punisher oh, no. just yet. Okay, okay. I want to take it all the way back because, man, I know that probably anybody from my era who read Marvel Comics is familiar with your work, if not your name. Right? I mean, your Sounds stuff... The, the, the work you did in the Handbook of the Marvel Universe was used in many other places, role-playing games and su uh, other kinds yeah. of supplements. Yeah, I think that's cool. Because of the highly precise nature, I mean, to me, Elliot R. Brown bridges the gap between cartooning and technical illustration. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so what I'm interested in learning about is, is, is about you, how this came to be. We'll talk about some of the specifics some of the generalities and any anywhere that you want to get into, we will definitely delve into. I do have a sort of nerdy agenda. Let her rip. Okay. Um, so, Elliot, tell me, I, I know you started working at Marvel Comics in 1978. I don't know anything before that. Can you give us the, the true secret origins of Elliot R. Brown? Sure. The, the tops of the waves are born in Boston. Mom and I came down to Midtown Manhattan to get away start over uh, just a few years later, uh, which would be, I think it was 1959. And uh, we lived on the east side on 45th Street, which was a, a weird, different, very different part of the world back then. And she got a job at, at Parade Magazine. And mom was an orphan. And so she had some kind of help in getting that job. But she had done some, she had done some writing and some work putting together newsletters where, wherever she came from and uh so they got her a job there and she was very happy there she stayed there for about a year then she moved on for some reason i don't remember no i don't remember why but then she found herself at kalish quigley and rosen a name i often mention on my blog elliotr.com brown.com thank you got nervous and um uh kq and r were these three guys who came from the parent company that owned Marvel. And they ran a whole bunch of other magazines at the time, um, returning Korean War veteran specialties like action of uh, male men. What's, what's going on? Oh, I'm here? sorry, Elliot. I'm just, I decided you mentioned your website. I oh, just wanted to show it while you're talking. You. Yes, I'm going to occasionally, <laughs> sorry, I didn't mention this. I'll occasionally no, share yeah, some right. visuals here about what we're talking about. As long as we're not disconnected. No, well, we're anyway, not. these these three guys sold all the advertising space in every magazine that was out there, and for for magazine management, which owned Marvel, and they that included Marvel. So mom got to know comic books. Uh, way few people got to know comic books out of the Marvel bullpen. And um, when I was a kid, I mean, this this happened. Uh, this was 1961 before the actual bullpen was a bullpen uh, that everyone knew about in comics. And something 
something like that. Anyway, I was a kid. I would come into the office and there'd be all these comic books lying around. This was before the Fantastic Four. So when the Fantastic Four came out, it was a big deal. And it's hard to believe there were these 50 count boxes of comic books just stacked all over the place. It was in the you know, crummy little midtown office, uh, Madison Avenue, you know, apartment building. And um, here you go, here you go, Elliot, have a couple. Here, share with your buddies. No, uh, they're mine, all mine. And I, I stacked them up and, and I had original runs for years. I know, untouched by human hands, factory air, right? Not even on a newsstand, nothing. And right out of the box. And what an era of comics to be getting that in. So yeah. tell me. Just before but, and right after. Yeah, all of them. So I, I don't mean to interrupt you, but to digress a second, what were Elliot, little Elliot's titles? Like, what was your thing? All of them. But Spider-Man was obviously a favorite. I mean, I'm still, he's still among my favorite characters. Fantastic Four, uh, the early days. Uh, I mean, ben Grimm alone was the, such a tragic figure, but I may have related more to Mr. Fantastic. Uh, as the scientist and citizen, but um, uh, with superpowers, I, I wasn't sure what my superpowers were at that point. Um, but, uh, you know, I was eight, <laughs> seven, <laughs> however old I was. And um, anyway, we moved to California. We had to leave them all behind. And that's why Oh, boo. Fantastic Four number one is worth, you know, half a million bucks these days. Because everybody got rid of them, including people who really didn't want them. Sure, and that's really only why they are worth anything, right? Exactly, exactly. So, uh, and for and that's and that's as it should. It just I wish I could have held on to a couple. Um, so we all we, we came back. If I could, if I could oh, say for a second, your yeah. love of Fantastic Four and Amazing Spider-Man really shows in your work. There are a couple of parts that really stick out to me that we're going to talk about soon. And I, uh, I yeah, I, I, the the Baxter Building was something that I had I had slaved over well before I was on staff. No, that's not, well, it's a long story. Well, okay. we're going to get back, to that because I feel like that's, I feel like that's one of your masterpieces. So I have, to, it's, that's my opus. That's the big one. That's the biggie for me. Um, the, the Baxter building two page spread. Okay. Um, now, well, I'm sorry to have digressed already. I know. But we're, young Go Elliot ahead. loves comics. Okay. We're back. We come back from California, go right back to the same damn junior high school I, I said, so long, suckers, too. <laughs> hi, hi, buddies. How you doing? Luckily, I had some very close friends from my elementary school, and they are still my friends to this day, 55, 58 years later. And uh, um, so I got back in touch with them, and we picked up where we left off. Um, went to uh, uh, skip forward. Well, I was a messenger boy at K2&R to Marvel, so I was... Stan knew me as a kid. Stan knew me as a child. And uh, I'd bring a couple of friends over every once in a blue moon. We'd sit on the couch and stare at each other. And there's Stan. Any questions? Not really, Mr. Lee. And off we go. But it was fun. And so when it was time for me to um, get out of high school, I went to the High School of Art and Design. I learned a lot of production concepts in, at a and And I sort of, uh, I, went, I went off to City College. I wanted to be an architect. You know, and that shows in the work. Um, uh, I was much more, much more happy doing uh, architectural uh, illustrations and renderings and such. And the guy who taught me perspective in high school was Dr. Erwin Muller, who was a wonderful, wonderful teacher, very funny old, older man. And he had done, he invented his own method of perspective. And it was a it was a mind blower for young Elliot Brown. Um, I could still do it today, but it's difficult. It's you know it's it's the real thing. You can establish um, uh, perspective uh, qualities. You can you can change the, the 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 lens angle and that sort of thing just by changing the vanishing points and lots of stuff like that. Anyway, still um, I cheat these days. I I make I make uh, a, a giant arcs out of uh, cardboard. Uh, illustration board and then you can put a t-square on it that <laughs> t-square what's that i don't know i don't even have one around <laughs> anyway the t-square slides up and down and you can have vanishing points that are 10 feet away if you cut the cardboard this way and that's how i do a lot of my modern stuff that's how i did the the baxter building for example okay you hammer these down into your board and you do the work um 
to get in, you know, and the sweep is perfect. So you get you, you pencil line and the ink line all line up. Okay, so so the te so this is the beginnings of your technical illustration yeah. formal education. Yes. Oh yeah. Um, oh no, I, I I seem to have a thing about thinking in three D. Um, even in California, I was in a uh, mechanical drafting class. I don't know what they were teaching back in those days, but this was Southern California. It was a strange part of the world. Long Beach, Long Beach, California. Will Rogers uh, Elementary School. No, junior high school. Huh. Yeah. Yeah. Very, yeah, and it's still there. Very different. Very different. Funny. All of a sudden, the building's the size of a, of a shoe store. It's just, it's teeny tiny. Anyway. Um, uh, so I'm really interested oh, in, in, in that period. Off. <laughs> yeah, no, it's okay. I'm, I'm going to chime in now and then and try and keep Please. us focused and get keep, keep me on track so i'm interested to know before you came to work at marvel which it looks to me it was age 24 in 1978 yes okay almost something i refer to as my career before my career yes this is what i want to know okay i got out of i got out of high school uh, i got out of college a very unhappy at college i learned way too much at art and design and here i was starting over after wasting time at, at City College, and it was it was a there was no advanced placement, no advanced standing, no recognition of all that I had learned. That was unfortunate, and I was bogging down. So I got out, and I got a job thanks to my Kalish Quigley and Rosen connection, um, with um, who who was that? Guy? Well, Ivan Snyder is the guy's name, and he's he's fairly well known in the business, uh, for being a kind of a you know a backroom hustler, deal maker, and what he seemed to do was be in charge of merchandise and satisfaction, which means you take your coupon out of the back of a book, you ask for Savage Sword number whatever, three, and you mail in a check or a money order. We get it. We take it off the rack. We stick it in an envelope, run the address through it, and send it off. So we satisfied the order. That's so this is your first work, though, for Marvel. Yes, yes. But, 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 pr but prior to that, did you have any military experience? That was no, one sir. question. No, I wish I had. Um, I think, I think uh, you know, when you're young is the best time for it. And if you survive, it's, I think you're better off for it. But that's just me. Um, uh, let's just say I, I made up for it in studying as hard as I could as a civilian. Got know. it. So out of college, formal education, you completed your degree, went no, to work. No. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. Oh, no. It's very disappointing. No, after about a year and a half, I bailed out. Okay. Oh, yeah. I like that better. Okay. Frankly, Elliot. Uh, so, so continue. That's definitely. You got it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay, great. So now we're there. Yeah. Yes. In I was there in 1974 to the best of my memory. This is, this is odd oh. because I ah. actually saw, I saw during a, during a reference trip, I saw the, the uh, people who were dismissed in 1975 and I wasn't among them. I know I, I had a lot of strange experiences at Marvel. <laughs> I went to a lot of places I shouldn't have, but I couldn't find me. So I don't know when I was there. I, I 73 to 74 or something like that. And okay. It's all a blur. It's a blur. But I spent a year doing that, and um, and then I left again, and I went off um, doing an awful job. Uh, I worked at an ad agency. Oh no, this is a good job. It was. A, I worked at an uh, uh, an ad agency where I I was office boy kickabout. Uh, messenger uh, messenger guy, I would go get newspapers from the out-of-town newspaper stand on 42nd Street, hotel rooms, and I would uh, cut out the little ads and send them off or the people wouldn't pay. The advertisers would not pay. So I was doing a lot of that. Then I learned how to run their giant stat camera. And I mean, this, this thing was monstrous. It, it made everything else look funny. It was a, a, a leftover process camera. And so that's, and I also had been interested in photography. Um, and so I was, I, at my own dark room briefly. Okay. For, for our youngsters oh. out there. Oh, God, yes, I know. A photo stack camera, it's a giant camera for taking the pictures of the original artwork, right, yeah. that gets turned into printing press plates eventually. Um, it was, it, we now think of scanning and xerography as uh, anything that needs to be changed to a certain size. You scan it, you run it through a paint box or Photoshop or whatever, or Illustrator, and you can cut it out to the right size. This was a way of doing it and coming up with a photographic print, really, a rather durable photographic print, that you could change to any size you need, and, okay. and you could reverse it. Got so, it. And, and by projecting, heavy proje duty. 
Yeah, and actual, actual, it was it was chemistry on darkroom paper. Yeah, yeah. Uh, a, a kind of a, a slightly different sort of darkroom paper, darkroom oh. paper, where you could work on it and, and do corrections and retouching. And, yeah. It's going to be really easy for me to sideline into technical jargon and stuff like that. And also, I'm assuming for you too. So I'm going to try my best not to get too sidelined in that stuff. I, I, I feel that the blog site suffers occasionally from that, where I have to, I feel I should describe what the hell I'm talking about. Because I can drop stat paper and, and you know, neg film and, and, a, and a reversal and a proof roll. But I, should, I have to describe it, or I feel like I'm doing a disservice to well, people who weren't there and even modern guys they didn't get to handle uh, proof rolls or, or work with stats because the xerox machines did fine yeah. work. I, I love hearing you though use that jargon in in context sure. maybe a glossary that explains a few of those yeah. terms would be a good thing that, i literally was thinking about that uh, last week because oh well well I I'll, I'll, let's say that for <laughs> yeah, my okay. for the end because man sure. i got a few things i gotta suggest okay. to you okay, okay. sure um, so there I am. I'm, I'm at this this place, and this place was a was a, a you know you know what headhunters are they're they're uh, they're help wanted uh, advertising, sure. but these were for executive and, and expensive jobs, uh, and so th th these were these guys were full of themselves, and uh, so I did I did I learned how to do page up and mechanical the way they wanted it done. And this was this was stuff you placed in the Times and the Daily News, newspapers within the city, of course. And um, uh, and that didn't last too long because I had a I, I came to blows with the art director about he wanted he want oh, no, never mind okay never mind <laughs> so anyway from there though I, that was your secret pre Marvel you bounced the back yes I, I came now back. you're back at Marvel it's 1978 ish or so late, that's right late 78 I'm back at Marvel I know how to use a stat camera Lenny Gro great guy he knew everything about printing and, and comic books he was. He and Danny Crespi, Danny Crespi, an old letterer from the good old days. Uh, when, I, don't th I think Danny would be a, Danny, Danny was an advertising guy who did, who did hand lettering, who did all kinds of signage and, and large type. And he did- I'm gonna share my stuff. screen again here, Elliot. Oh yeah, oh sure, that's fine. Hello, Ant-Man. I love that guy. It was so simple back then. You had a little FM radio chassis and a, and a oh, and that's us. That's that's Bob Camp's artwork. Uh, genius. Ah, Bob yeah, Camp. who went on to work on animation, right? Ren and Stimpy yep. and among other he things. He actually, he came from animation to work on this, make some money. Um, he did, he, he, he banged some of these out. I think he did. Uh, or did we do them? You We're know, talking about Bob Camp here. Yeah, that's Bob. Here's, here's oh, young sure. Elliot Brown uh, listed as typesetter. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. All right, all right. So... I shouldn't be I shouldn't be naming names because that's that's Larry Hama's uh uh, uh Annie Nascenti and, and and Marie Severin's Ralph. I guess Bob didn't do them all. But well, actually the is, illustrations it says uh secret to you know to protect the innocent or to protect yeah. the guilty rather at yeah. the bottom. Yeah, so yes, guilty indeed. You just revealed a major bit of Marvel behind the yeah. scenes history, sir. Yeah, I must have. I must have. I can't imagine. I get the feeling maybe we all did our own. Could that be right? So qu okay. quickly, you're, you're working at Marvel Comics, you're working the stat camera, but pretty quickly from right. what I read. No, no, no. Uh, I, I ran the stat camera for three years. Uh, me and Robbie Caracella, who is, uh, let's see, he's, he's uh, number three on the left there, top row. Mm -hmm. um, Robbie and I ran the ca two cameras, and they were much smaller cameras. They were all modern, which was really nice. They, they were pretty good. And uh, we just did tons of The only, the only time I got to play with it was um, I would leave the lens open at some point and I would uh, zoom the copy board out and get a star pattern, which I gave to uh, Archie Goodwin, who ran it in a Star Wars uh, page. We get the star field zooming in. Uh, the, the, the trip to light speed, the, the, the shot of where the, the Millennium Falcon goes to light speed. So I did that. Um, that's when you have fun with the machine. Um, uh, so after that, it was time for us to move downtown uh, Mark Gruenwald. Uh, Mark Gruenwald, editor, was, was an assistant at that point, I think. And he wanted to do, we did the production of his magazine. Yeah, that's the man. Um, on staff, overnight, the week we moved. And we literally opened up the box and picked up stuff out 
uh, whatever that was, Monday morning, and just started finishing up the art at that point. So we literally, we, we straddled the two bullpens um, over that week. I think it was the weekend. Yeah, Me meaning, the the, the, meaning the production bullpen and the yes. editorial yes. bullpen? The Marvel bullpen. Yeah, we, we did his magazine. Um, Alternity? Get the wrong title. Alternative magazine, which is still, you know, respected. It was where he, he banged together universes. He talked about DC characters. He talked about Marvel characters and, and uh, fictional history, fantasy guys, poems, and uh, uh, all of the uh, uh, Vern figures, as real Fu Manchu, that sort of thing. All, all is real and mixed them all together. He had a bunch of wild cohorts. One of them was Peter Sanderson, who went on to work at the, uh, uh, with the, the Marvel Universe. Uh, a great brain. Huge, a huge uh, mental filing cabinet of, of information and things like that. Fascinating guy. Um, so Grunewald did that. And then we immediately started working on the, we figured, you know, we, we warmed up doing that. We did this, you know, this, this pressure cooker job where you, I ran the stats, I ran, I also did type. At that point, I was moved into the typesetting world. And back then, we had a very strange computer run by, uh, made by Mergenthaler who made linotype machines for making newspaper prints. And they wanted to step into cold type, which was hot type, made out of cold lead, poured into molds. It's hard to, hard to explain with any facility, without any show and tell. Anyway, so we had, um, um, it was more of a photographic process. So once again, here I am, I'm running a, you know, a, a photo okay. processing machine. And um, uh, so we were, we were really, we, Figured we had this is the shakedown cruise, and now we're going to start. We got the green light to do the Marvel Universe, and it took us six weeks, probably a full two months, to do the first issue, which included me figuring out my artwork end of it. Too. Are you talking about official handbook? Yes. The Ohio okay. Wait, so so yeah. let, let's get to that in a second. So okay. Oh yeah, sure. <clears throat> so you you're working in the stat room. You put in your dues years. Yeah. Yeah. You caught the attention. Of Tom DeFalco. Yes, yes. When, uh, not not immediately. That took about a year. Because Gruenwald was Tom's assistant at that point. And, ah. I mean, it was hard not to ignore me. I don't know, a big blob of a, of a nerd. I'd be in Mark's office all the time looking at Tom. And um, uh, I had done, uh, uh, Mark and I had come up with some independent ideas. I'd done some drawings for him. He saw what I could do. Um, we were having our fun, and that's when we knew we were going to move from 57th Street and Madison Avenue down to 27th Street, 28th, 27th Street on Park Avenue. And so that's when we started his book, did it all. Um, I had just become acquainted. I was out of the stat department and into the typesetting world, which was you know, my own empire, essentially. Um, that was very little, a very short period of time. Seventh Street, and then we moved to downtown, finished his magazine, and then we literally started the Marvel Universe the, the month we arrived uh, on 28th Street. Brand new building, brand new everything. It, you know, it's just a, it's can, can I ask you, chronologically, yeah. chronologically yeah. speaking, oh, sure. which, which, um, which came first, the Marvel Universe stuff, the, the first Marvel Universe handbook, or some of the photo covers that you did? Because I wanted to touch briefly on some oh. of the photo covers. Oh, all the time. I mean, uh, interleaved. Um, uh, the, the photo covers came first. The sub, I think the Submariner one is the one I did first, where I literally hung the camera out the window and shot Madison Avenue. Okay, I'm going to share my screen one more time. I don't have, all of, I don't have no, all of I, the photo I've covers been, here. I'm slowly putting them together. Um, but I've got the ones that I could find. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, and, and of these, you know, the one that really is the standout to me that just in my opinion really works and holds up really well is the amazing Spider-Man. Funny story. So how, that, how do you feel about, and I'm assuming that's you it. with that camera back there. Yes, that is me with a camera, but it's not a camera. That's what I think is hilarious. And I thought, I thought by blasting the, 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 the taking camera with the strobe that it would wash everything out. But if you look at it carefully, you can see that I'm holding a tape dispenser. <laughs> and the strobe has a, a synchronization wire that hangs right down in front of me. I see and it. 
Yeah, yeah. And and you know, I had another stroke set off set, set off to the side to catch uh, Scott Letta Leva L A B A, um, who was a stunt man, a very interesting guy uh, in and of himself. He he also made a couple of bucks wearing a Spider Man costume to uh, in store appearances where the okay. characters would actually. Well, he's the key because not only is he looking great in the costume, the yep. costume's great. His look itself is great. But he to an, me, he's an actor. Yeah, he, I mean, he was a little of everything. Uh, I don't know what he's up to these days, but he's a, he's a, an awfully nice guy. We spend a nice, you know, whatever it was, hour and a half together. It's very, it, it's very enjoyable. To me, it's the simplicity, though, of that cover. I love, yep. I love all of these. But of them all, the one that's sort of like, I, I could almost see like on the stands today with slight trade dress changes, that this amazing Spider-Man really holds up to me. That's very nice. I appreciate that. Yes. I can't remember if anybody <clears throat> um, designed it, but that's it. That's, you know, we found that room is the, is the proof roll storage room in the very back of, uh, of uh, 387 Park Avenue. Okay, so now I'm showing two, two kind right. of different well, ones. One that was oh, yeah. more photo predominant in the foreground, yeah. and one that I'm assuming you just, you did the, the background, background photo for. Yeah, yeah. And Bob um, Layton did the... the, the he did Pencils the stealth armor. armor, yeah. The background is where I went up to the Empire State Building at night, and I, I you know, held the camera up to the railing and shot over the edge, took, took a bunch of pictures. Um, the Dazzler was, that one was shot back at 575 um, on 57th Street, back before, uh, I don't know, you know, that, that'd be 79, 80, something like that. Um, and this was an astonishingly good looking gown that came in. <laughs> and you can't tell. So, walked it. Yeah, I know. I believe me. This was this was one of the more sedate pictures. I, I think I've, I've, <laughs> I've done a. I just did a page about the Dazzler. A bunch, a couple oh, of okay, outtakes. great. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to be coming up to, to the Iron the, the Iron Man one. I I turned around and took pictures of the of the uh, the antenna mast that was right above the hundred second floor uh, observatory. Uh, the, yeah, hundred second floor. Yeah, observatory. And I can't find that slide, so I know it's here somewhere. I can find well, that, I'll be happy. Anyway. Regarding, regarding the Iron Man, just really briefly, sure. why is it to me that your work and Bob Layton's work seem to go well together? If that makes sense to you. Maybe that doesn't make sense. Maybe it, that do it does. It doesn't for purposes. I mean, Bob, Bob is a very skilled draftsman. Bob's not such a great artist artist He's, he doesn't have the flourishes and the and the and the and the extra little shots and, and giggles that, that go into a piece he's very clean and lean as i trust my photography is and my own style um I, one of my other influences was uh Hergé, who did tint it of course and uh that that just that filled my brain when i was a kid and i'm not sure what bob's influences were bob as i say great technician uh, I feel like Bob is the definitive Iron Man artist of that period, certainly. Like, there's no doubt about it. When it came time to do the um, Iron Manual, uh, I, I turned to Bob for a great deal of the reference, and I was very happy. He drew everything. He drew, he drew everything I needed to see. Um, the only other person I, I looked at was uh, John Jr. Right. Did, well, did to, and, and to, not to digress too much more, but I know. I, in a lot of some of the role-playing supplements I read as a kid, it, a lot of Leighton Iron Man pictures were right next to brown diagrams. So yeah, exactly. maybe and, and that makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah, I had to stuff. I had to stuff everything into a very thin layer, and I could see it better on, on Leighton stuff. Okay, my all-time favorite photo cover that of yours I have seen so far has to be the Mask of Doom. But while I was looking at this for this, though, I found this Marvel Fumetti book, which I had never even heard of before. You're kidding. So I wondered if you could oh, yeah. briefly tell me something about either of these. Or both okay, of well, this one, the, 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 the mask picture, that is, I wish to, I'd love to be able to say I made that mask. But unfortunately, this is from the rest of that in-store appearance where, uh, crowd, where they made up costumes. And they had a Doctor Doom costume, but it was not so bad. <coughs> Pardon me. And, uh, no, no, no. Excuse me. And, um, um, I built a little light box and cut a hole out for some cardboard and put the mask on top of it, put a 500 watt light bulb down there. I had looped the security guard who watched over us at night. I don't know, eight or nine at night. He came over and uh, he started blowing cigarette smoke. The smoker, he blew cigarette smoke. And I took exposures with my, with a, a, a 
35 millimeter camera, none of them seem to do well enough. The, the artwork that's there, the eye beams that's coming out, are uh, Ron Zalming's interpretation of the faint wisps of smoke that are there, which was too bad because I really tried hard. Um, I like that cover a lot. This is when, this is when uh, in the John Byrne storyline where the mask comes awake in, in the Fantastic Four building and runs around and goes, does happen. So that was that. And um, talk about during, during a, a, an epic run on the Fantastic Four. Yep. I mean, second John only to Lee Kirby, I think. Yeah, yeah I, I believe, yeah, in, strictly and in, in numerically, yeah. Um, certainly in, I mean, in, you know, you can't take much away from Stan and Jack, uh, but, uh, uh, John sure was an influence. I've got to admit, John. John was a very great guy. Great, uh, one of the great guys. A, a, a great talent. Um, a genius. You know, Agreed. Order of Stan, or more, if, if that's possible. Um, speaking of Stan, the Fometti book. Um, yes. That was one of those ideas. Fometti uh, yeah, is the Italian word for uh, smoke shadows, or something like that. And uh, that was a, an old. Um, uh, standard piece of, of uh, Italian storytelling, uh, photo novellas, uh, where you would uh, take pictures and, and write dialogue in as though they were comic books. And so we, that's what we did. Um, this, this is a sad uh, chapter in Marvel's history only because through a printer's error, of perhaps misinterpreting uh, the, uh, the editor's instructions, all of the art, which were photographs, were, was shot through uh, the, the protective layer of vellum. So it looks oh. terrible. And one of the things I'm starting to do is to print some of the prints that I have, uh, put them up online, and to, um, I, I've, when Mark Grunewald died in uh, 1996, still can't believe it, it's been 23 years counting, um, he left me a bunch of uh, things. And among those things were um, pages, uh, maybe maybe half a dozen to a to, Six, seven, eight pages of um, of the, the boards themselves, without without the copies and some pictures. Um, and uh, I'm I'm going to start going back to them and, and putting them up online. So well, I, I'd like to look. At, I feel like Fumetti is something that's uh, that can be very difficult to pull off well. Ro Robert Crumb did some. I yeah, remember yeah. reading. Oh, there, it's out there. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, Mad Magazine, um, uh, National Lampoon certainly was famous for it. Uh, the Monty Python guys were in Manhattan back in 1960 something, and they did it. You know, you can, you can still yeah, there's just things. something about the there. the way it's often presented, where some comes off as good comics. I guess it depends on the photographer and the staging. Others yeah. less so. Like it's, it seems like a difficult thing to do. It was. Um, it's difficult only if you're trying to do something more than photography. We had people actually doing special effects and artwork yes, right on the print. Yes. So. And okay. I took, a, I mean, I may have taken a third or a half of the pictures. And uh, Vince Coletta, Vinny Coletta, inker extraordinaire, legendary inker, um, was also a, a, a serious photographer. A, 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 I, hard to know exactly what level he may have even called himself. Uh, could be, could be pro. He may have sold. He had, he came in with uh, Veronica's, which is the, you know, the poor man's house of blood, but still, you know, it's a large view camera. Okay, um, if we could fast forward yeah. for a second. Sure. Um, past Marvel Universe, which we're going to come right back to. Okay. And, and these are the latest two photo covers that I was able to find. I, yeah. I'm not even positive yeah. that you did these covers, but I Oh, think yeah, I did them. I did them. Um, the one on the left, I mean, both of them, both of them were, were Don Daly, the editor of the, of the whole line of Punisher books. Um, he said, I need, a, I, need a, I need a wedding cake. Uh, I need a Punisher on a wedding cake. Can you shoot that for me overnight? I said, yes, I can. And, uh, you know, did it. Um, I made that cake out of cardboard and uh, vinyl spackle. And then I, I, there's this place called The Last Wound-Up, which is a whole bunch of wind-up toys. And I happened to find uh, bride and groom dummies in there. So that's, you know, I made, the, I made the victims. And I set it up in the bullpen and shot it. Uh, you know, I put it all together. I <laughs> don't look too closely at the girl's arms uh, because I carved them out of uh, stuff that isn't meant to be carved. It, was, uh, it felt like toothpaste at, at the point. Uh, I found it. Um, uh, but that was, you know, I was happy I could do that one. That, uh, the, 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 the other Punisher one, uh, number 57, I just did a page on that. It's my old buddy, a high school chum, uh, who, who, who sadly just passed away a few years ago. Mm -hmm. He had a heart attack. He was a weightlifter. He was, he was a burly fellow. I always, I always enjoyed it. But he also had, he had very um, 
distinctive eyes. He had a, a distinctive shade of blue, which I thought was great. I wish I could have lightened up that gun a bit more. Um, the, that's the trouble with printing on, on in general. Um, if you're not very careful with the originals, uh, you, every time you make a copy, you gain contrast. And what I could see on the chrome of the original uh, images um, ah. is just not there, which is a shame. I, I got to ask, uh, was this... Buddy, my, my buddy's name is John Walters, which I, you know, sorry to miss him. Sorry, no. he's gone. Was this the infamous story where Punisher gets a new face and is re comes back <laughs> as a black guy? I, um, I'm shamefaced to say I never read them at that point. <laughs> too much, that's, too much. That's sad because you obviously have a real affinity for, for, for the Punisher that we're going to get into quite soon. Um, um, an interesting point about, about my affinity for any of the human side of Marvel Comics, I, I, don't, I don't particularly identify with superpowers that much. Right. All of my favorite characters, from Indiana Jones to, uh, to uh, uh, Nick Fury to even uh, uh, Tony Stark, uh, the Punisher, uh, Frank Castle, are all humans and with human, with human problems and human foibles. And that's what, that's, that's, I think that shows. Uh, Human problems, but super badass equipment, Elliot. Exactly right. Yes. And you're yes. obviously somebody that is into. This is what is amazing about your body of work. I'm going to gush for one for one moment uh, here. Well, thank because you. you have you straddle you do so many different things in your technical illustration from illustrating things that are complete works of a uh, 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 fantasy like Asgard uh, yeah. to things that are completely real off the shelf technologies, if you will, oh, yeah. into tried. super science fiction, and then even things that bridging the gap between reality and science fiction, and like we're gonna okay. get into in a second here. So, okay. Um, okay. so first, the, the, one of your skills, I, I don't know all the terminology here. When I say technical illustration, does that encompass cartography as well as drafting? And I believe so. Um, it's hard to know if, I also studied cartography as an amateur, and, and my wife um, took it in college. So I got, to, I got to actually play with a planimeter and see how that worked. That was well, Ella, you were profiled in the Smithsonian Magazine as a cartographer, so I think yeah. you got yes. it. Yes. Pal. That may be. Well, that was, that was for the DC uh, Gotham map. We're uh, going to talk okay. about that quite okay. soon. Okay, good. Don't mean to jump around too much. Um, this particular page with Asgard, um, Mark Grunewald sketched it up. And then I tightened it up and I, and I, I went, I tried to make it, I tried to make some of the loop-de-loops as real as possible. Um, he'd, he'd already started on some of the flames and the, and the rocks and the mountains. So I was a little sketchy here and there, but we, we, we got it together. Um, I still have that, the original of that in my home hung up to remind me of my old buddy, uh, which is uh, sometimes it's hard. Um, he had penciled this map and I just followed the, the, the drawing. No, I'm uh, sorry. Follow the lines. That's quite all right. Uh, and, uh, I'm, for, for a moment, I want to stray away from technical history sure. just for a second because oh, yeah. I discovered something I never knew that you were the creator of Spitfire and the Troubleshooters. Co creator, me and Jack Morelli, my old pal. And the, and the plot of the first issue. Yeah, no, the plot of the creation of the whole damn thing. Um, and when I think, because I bought every single new universe book off the stand okay. as it came out. Okay. I yeah, I'm, I, 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 that was a strange time in my life. Um, when the editor in chief comes to you and says, uh, I want to make you an editor, and here's a bunch of books you're going to do. Uh, you're going to create one, you're going to do this. Except I can't tell anybody you're an editor. Well, okay, I tell it's okay. You say yes. And that's well, what I did. Spitfire, I just wanted to touch on it briefly. I mean, yeah. it didn't make oh, a okay. huge impact in the new universe. I, I do want to come back to new universe and that era. Of time and the stuff that you work on. I just wanted to touch on that Spitfire and the Troubleshooters. When I thought back to it, all I remembered was it seemed like a grounded Iron Man concept. And when I went back and I did some research and I looked this up and I read some quotes from you that said that exact, almost that exact thing. Like it was trying to take Iron Man out of science yep. fiction and bring it into like mechanical reality. The, the difference between, I mean, figuring out Iron Man, which is several orders of magnitude further along than anything we're used to right now. Um, and figuring out Spitfire was uh, in the 60s, the army had been experimenting with uh, high efficiency electric motors and working on exoskeletons 
And that's when my little brain snapped to and started gobbling up everything I could find. Popular science, popular mechanics, popular science magazines out there. And I just, I watched everything I could. Whenever I saw something, it stuck in my brain. I don't know why, but it did. And so when it came time to do Spitfire, which apparently took place in an optimal universe where there were no advantages of super science or Tony Stark working on his uh, uh, military hardware in secret, um, or finding the, the general in Vietnam who had figured out, the scientists who had figured out his version of, of uh, nanotechnology, for lack of a better term at the time, um, that's what I was hoping the Spitfire costume would wind up looking like. Um, high efficiency motors and uh, um, all electric, um, you know, with miniature turbines that would really, really collect air and work. And you can see these days, um, if 20, 30 years along after Spitfire's time, we do have flying guys with miniature turbines. Um, what was not well known at the time was that uh, cruise missiles had uh, high efficiency miniature turbines. And mm. I did know that <laughs> at the time, uh, but it wasn't generally well known. Ah. But I, I, I also stuck my nose in you know a lot of places. I, I read well, a lot of weird I, stuff. I, I, I love that grounded I tried. look at, at technology. And, and I was really, I didn't, I read Spitfire the early years, and then I read what it became, and it became sort of the antithesis of that with almost I, magical yes. nanotechnology. Yes. It's the, 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 the reality is, it behind the scenes, I, I just barely got half the script turned in before I was let go from Marvel Comics. Um, I took too long doing other work uh, as editor of four other titles, including Starbrand. And uh, uh, what, for whatever, whatever needed to be done, I was the one who took the blame and out I went. Um, and then Jerry Conway came in and uh, um, did a workmanlike, fairly reasonable job. Um, I think Jerry had the technical awareness of a turtle, but that's just my opinion. And uh, it turned into, you know, crappy romance. And, you know, uh, I'm trip. sorry, but her. Jerry did to your baby what he did to Gwen Stacy. I'm just going to say. Yeah, I, that's what, and Jerry is why I stopped reading Spider-Man. Because you know, <laughs> you're, not little, the, a, you're not the part. only one. <laughs> I've heard that, that several times from several people. Yeah, I mean, but you know, hey, guy's a pro. Did it, he, he, he had to work under tough circumstances and picked up a book uh, that he didn't know much about. He just he made it he made it work for himself. Uh, for, who wants to follow Mr. Technical <laughs> on a technical book? Are you kidding me? <laughs> well, I don't think he was paying that close attention to my career at that point. Okay. He, so he was, this book was shoved under his transom and he just took it and ran. Which is, okay, let's forget which is, about that of, okay. era for a moment. Let's jump back to the Marvel Universe. And when I looked, I saw you did, okay, besides equipment drawings and vehicle drawings, science fiction suit drawings, it comes back to architecture drawings. Yeah, yeah. Both 2D blueprints, like the layout of Spider-Man's apartment and yeah, Daredevil's yeah. brownstone. yeah. Yeah, which was something nobody, I can't believe anybody was clamoring. Like, who was asking for that? Yeah, who, 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 who indeed? Who still? Um, it turns out one of the guys, someone, who you would often get calls from the front desk. There's somebody in the, in the reception area who needs to speak to you. And there's, there's this gigantic kid. And he says, we're developing a game. We, I need to know the scale of Daredevil's apartment. I said, well, I didn't exactly do it to scale. I did it on a standard New York City lot width of 25 feet. And, you know, it's 70, a 7,500 foot depth, it's only 75 feet of it in view. So if you figure that out, each doorway is 31 inches. He, he says, oh yeah, oh yeah, okay. Then he runs away. And for all I know, that's part of the universe of that game, whatever it was. So well, that's that where, funny. man, the Marvel Universe role-playing game, for instance, was a huge thing for me. And so much of your work was used. And okay. the ability to take something like that and just translate it into a gaming map where like, this is really where Spider-Man lives. And like, that's his, that, yeah. that was an amazing resource. I tried very hard. Well, also, I mean, I'm a, I was a New York kid. Uh, my best friend, you know, that one of those childhood guys. I mean, I've got, I've got four best friends. So everybody, you know, Jack, Bill, you all calm down. My friend James Sanders is a real architect. And we would plow through buildings and his... His stepmom was uh, worked for the Municipal Arts Society, the Brooklyn City Planning Commission. So we got to go places that most kids did, and uh, we enjoyed it endlessly. And I picked up all the information. I stayed current in architectural stuff thanks to thanks to my buddy at the time. You know, not so much now. I live upstate and he's still in Manhattan. Uh, bless him. And uh, oh. so I, 
I did I did tons of stuff with all right, yes. Speaking of uh, this is why I just wanted to bring oh, this picture yeah. up because when I was going through all your stuff, I got to the whenever I get to you, any of your work on Fantastic Four equipment, I go, This guy loves the Fantastic Four. I did. I did. Okay, the backstory is the backstory is back and, and this career, review, career. I viewed it just looking at it, I viewed it as this is your magnum opus. This was the most beautiful architectural thing I've seen from you. So please tell us. Okay. More. The the backstory is is that in the career before the career. I had done some drawings of the floor plans as I saw them of the Baxter building back then. And I brought them into the editor at the time who was, I think, Jim Salicrow. And Jim, you know, he was, we were all younger, let's put it that way. And he was still an editor, you know, new editor, young brain editor. He says, I ask you to do this, did I? And I went away with my tail between my legs. And then, you know, 15 years later, I did that. Um, the, uh, this was for the uh, 350th, well, no, 35th year, 35th year, which is, is that right? It was issue 353 or something like that. Anyway, I forget what it was. But I'm, it was I'm big, gonna, I'm it was gonna a keep die cut Fantastic Four book, which which had uh, you know all of those characters. I just okay. I'm gonna keep going through these illustrations. I'm just gonna keep That's sort right. of as you talk about it, I'm mm -hmm. gonna leaf through them because. This was a great example to me of the 2D blueprints and then the th the, the 3D uh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. drawing of the building. So well, talk at one point, process a little bit if you can. The, 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 the hardest part of this job was that at one point I had the floor plans floating one on top of the other. I said, okay, this is good and bad. I should stop here. And then I, I, I sort of noodled in a couple of details and I said, all right, I can't stop. And I, I finished rendering everything. Um, and I felt this was, this was tough. I got to say, this was physically challenging. It took me two weeks to pencil everything because I would often go back and change things. Um, I also had to tie up my drafting area with, the, you know, with the, with the boards and, and those, those sweeping arcs that I mentioned. You can, you can just tell how, how, how distant the vanishing points are, but how accurately all of the lines swoop down uh, from, from, well, eight foot vanishing point to six foot vanishing point. And then one from the bottom as well, a three point vanishing point. So it was a big, it was a physically demanding because I had to lean over everything to get this just so. And um, I tell you, it was, it was 10 hour days, seven straight days in a row to meet the deadline. And my shame of this piece is the, the, uh, the top building, the top of the building is open. I had plans to fill it full of stuff. And I had to stop. You know, the, the page was due. It, I'd already spent three weeks on this drawing, and it was that was a lot. And I only got paid, you know, so much. That was that. I mean, there's a point where, yes, we we do certain things for love and uh, you know, a tribute to the characters and the importance to my for my personal self um, and the world at large. But um, you got to pay the bills. I just got married. I was I was a freelancer at that point. And uh, that was a that was a tough one. I had to stop. And, and uh, this this is this is a thing of beauty to me as I look at it. Like, I don't know. Thank you. I know a lot of people love your work, but it's not it's not every comic fan who's really keys into this kind of stuff. But no, but, and that's okay. That's okay. That's why I mean, I I think comics can tell any story. I think comics can appeal to anybody if you have a certain well, interest in something. I, I, I'm just. Out. I just want to say though that the the level of, of of care and love and detail and reality and walking that line between reality and unreality brought the Marvel Universe to a different level of reality in in young Danny's mind anyway, and I know a lot of other kids. Yeah. I appreciate that. It, it uh, you know it it helps on those cold winter nights to <laughs> keep the keep the heart going. Okay, so speaking of which, clearly. You also loved Spider-Man. We talked about this. Uh, yes. Yes, I did. And my, my, a lot of, of thinking love. had to go into this because, I mean, frankly, yeah. the web shooter was like a throwaway invention in Amazing Fantasy. Like, like oh, yeah, I'll just invent this amazing chemical yeah. and machine yeah. that could not possibly yeah. exist. And I'm 16 years old. I know. Uh, well, see, this is something else that, that sort of bothered me over time. Peter Parker was not just a science student, but he was a 
he was a real polymath. He he was he was an engineering student, and he yes. he uh, he was a materials engineer. Um, they they gave him access. This 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 sort of thing can't be made at home. This has to be made with a with a lathe, and he worse yet, a watchmaker's lathe. And so, and you're you're doing castings. That, you know, those are metal objects. And you said similar things about Hank Pym in the Pym yeah. articles. You have an article on your website about that. Yeah. I wanted, if we have time here, once we get past the history, there's some of the like know. rating of the super geeks that I wanted to get into with, with you. But we'll wait. We'll, sure. we'll, I, I want to go through the Spider Man stuff because to me, this stuff it threads the line between what is real and possible and what is totally science fiction, especially when we get into the camera stuff. You're a camera geek. Ah, uh, yes, I was a camera geek. Yes. So that, how much? That, that's a Leica R3. That's why you know. And I said, well, it had to come from his. Uh, oh no, no, that's the wide look. I'm sorry, that's the wide look. The whole point was, you see, we'd see Spider-Man hanging from a corner of a building, and he 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 blew his camera up at a random angle. Well, you know, there's cameras don't see everything unless you point them. And so to make something that does see everything, you need a super wide angle lens. And this was the only way I could figure out to get shots of everything. So at some point you could crop into the fight or the battle. If, you're, if, the, if the field of view is a giant wide screen frame and you're fighting over here, and then you take the fight over here, well, how do you get pictures of both unless you can catch it all? So that, was my, that was my theory. Who can say? At some point- well, I remember- at some point in the comics, was uh, I'm, they addressed at some point in the comics that like Peter Parker was famous for these pictures of Spider-Man, but he was really not a great photographer. Like the framing was weird, <laughs> that and, would the, be, that, and that all fed into what I thought of, yeah, right? As as the as the as the reason why. Um, the, <laughs> I look at some of this stuff. Kind of sweet back in the good old days. Because who's asking, Elliot, who came to you and said, we need to know, we need to know how the motors work on Spider-Man's you know, oh, self-driving. Oh, no, nobody, no, but that was all me. I, I, I went off on my own change. Uh, I love it. And this is where your passions, your intersection of your passions yeah. brings something together that I don't know anybody else who could have. Like, I've seen other science fiction-y diagrams and stuff in other comic books. Yeah. There's Elliot R. Brown, and there is everybody else, sir. In, I, I, my mom taught me to be modest, but in my moments of immodesty, I do sort of say that's I'm the, I'm the one guy. I'm, I'm, I'm the only the only aerospace engineer, optical technician, and architect, and and big project manager they ever had. I I wanted to call you the Hank Pym of like the bullpen. <laughs> he did an awful lot. Yes, he had he had several jobs. It's true. That's why I yeah. used the Ant Man as, as the beginning image on right. on your thing because to me the the idea of the polymath and the citizen scientist, which you brought up as soon as we started yeah. this call, the idea that there is plenty out there to learn. You don't have to have a degree. There's enough books and enough information that you can. At least get a working knowledge of things that are well far. above yeah. your pay grade. Yeah, you, you can do you can do pretty well. It's true. So tell me uh, a little bit briefly. Aerospace, fantastic car, Quinjet. I just like what is the thinking that goes into designing something like this? Because we've only seen the exterior of these objects. Right. We don't know anything about the interior. So um, among um, there was there was a British outfit. Of course, the British you know always interested in technology above and beyond their pay grades. Um, uh, they there was a series of books put out by a, an outfit called the Pilot Press, and they did these incredibly sweet phantom views and cutaway drawings of all sorts of aircraft. And I couldn't afford them, but I uh, I remember a good friend of mine had a couple, and I used to stare at them like a like a mental patient for years. And and, and apparently it soaked in. They would show all of the formers and stringers, the parts of the plane. Um, they would uh, uh, show every pretty much essential bit and piece without drawing technical cutaways of everything. Um, which I, and I also enjoyed the space program, our space program. Um, so the, the, the Quinjet was the very first uh, uh, techie drawing I did. Uh, I think I did Avengers Mansion, but I might have done it second. This was the first one, because I knew, I knew this was gonna be a big pain in the neck, because um, I didn't understand it. What, if I had anything, Anything going for me in my brain is that I could tell where things had to fit and stuff in in 3D. So I stuffed engines and I stuffed ductwork in there 
um, that would actually fit in a real a real vehicle. Would it really I mean, work? I don't know. But would, sure. it, would it fit? Yes. But um, not just duct work, Elliot, but variable geometry ducting. It's that, well, that, those yeah, kind well. of people. Those kind of details of phrase, uh, you're looking at other references for some of this stuff. How much of this is just pulled out of your brain of, of words that go together? No, and how no, much no. of it was the F1 said uh, the 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 uh, the uh, the uh, which one is it? I can't remember which one it is. The Aardvark. It's the swing wing uh, fighter jet. The Aardvark uh, uh, has and the Harrier. The Harrier jump jet also has variable ducting. So I get I get all my stuff from usually real places. I don't have to make stuff up. Um, the bad part was, all right, here's, here's my, here's my, 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 my rant, my, my anger, uh, over comic books. They want too much. They ask too much of aircraft. The, uh, uh, Dave Cockrum, I love that guy. One of the finest uh, illustrators to grace Marvel Hall. Dave Cockrum, aviation madman, um, he used, he picked an SR-71 as the X-Men Blackbird jet. Unfortunately, it held all seven people. The Blackbird right. jet practically is, a, is you wear the plane around you. You're, you're so tight inside of your pressure shoe, shoe on, you can't really fit very well. When it came time for me to do the, the X-Jet, I had to figure out how to stuff people into it. So I made it a different proportion. And that's the trouble. It also, it, it hovered, which of course the irregular SR-71 does not. And uh, this thing as well, it did too much. It took off. Well, that every superhero plane up. is <laughs> well, vertical takeoff yes, and land, right? Like, but they didn't have to explain it. Yeah. The Quinjet right. actually they didn't has have to seven draw a diagram there. and show the damn turbines and, yeah. and, and the power yeah. source. I got yeah, it. Exactly. Well, I want to show something a little more, another piece of equipment. I'm really geeking out on this because. Uh, yeah. I saw this, uh, there was a recently a uh, Hawkeye series. You know, I loved, I, that, that blew my mind. Do you saw, when these, okay. When these guys did that, I still don't believe it. That, so does that not tell you how your work has uh, yeah. influenced it, the canon? It, yeah, these guys, so indeed, Asian. Just for and, anybody who knows, they took these unique arrow shapes and the names chosen for these arrows and preserved them. So the putty arrow looked like an Elliot R. Brown yeah. putty arrow. Yeah, he, he redrew the stuff. He, what's more interesting is that they went down each one box by box and told part of the story with it. I thought that was just so clever. A, a wonderful a wonderful repurposing and reuse of, of my work. I, and, I love it. and this was, Hawkeye was Mark Grunewald's uh, uh, signature character for a, a long while. And he came up with most of these that weren't originally done in the books uh, before he got to them. So all of these, and these work to the best of my understanding of how to make such a thing work with blow up devices and, and high and sure. small explosive charges and uh, electronics built in, unfolding just so. I tried. Well, just the, the, the different shape for each one, that is something that nobody yeah. would even bother to think about. And I, I love it. <laughs> well, there was the boxing glove. <laughs> Somewhere. Well, and then the idea that the mo they were modular arrows and you could carry the yeah. different arrowheads and the quick release clamping mechanisms. Are you it's kidding me? Yeah. Like, it had to be. It was that your stuff? Yeah. Love it. Um, so, from hot, I'm still on equipment because this is just my sure. passion. Yeah, well, I, yeah. Okay. These to me, like Stilt Man. Ah, yeah. Okay. Well, uh, Stilt Man is a terrible, a terrible failure. I, it's I a started, signature piece to me, though. I, like this, uh, I think of. Thank you. Maybe I shouldn't spoil it for you then. Please, <laughs> okay. spoil it for you. Ruin me. Ru ruin I, my expectations. I, I, I started on a particular method of, of extending the, the, the length of the legs, and I realized I'd chosen the wrong method, and I cheated. Um, instead of these pistons, a hydraulic system, which was you know old technology in the 60s, um, instead of the pistons being being cylindrical, they were <laughs> rectangular, and uh, there is no such thing. And so, then there can't be any such thing. However, you don't want to pressurize a rectangular container, Elliot. I, I, I didn't want to see it. I didn't well, want to. Good. Out I, well, thank you. This drawing. This was this was one of the last drawings in the book. I was working on it overnight in the bullpen. We, I don't know if you've read any of the accounts of my uh, of our all our sleeping in the office for weeks and months on end. Um, this was, you know, this was a, a, a 
cold. It was the middle of the winter. They shut off the heat in the building. And I'm drawing this thing, you know, shivering, and I'm trying, you know, good thing I use templates in straight edges because I, my hand was shaking. I'm drawing this, I'm working on this, and I'm figuring out the head. And I realized he couldn't see his feet. He's walking, you know, his feet are 30 feet away. And I started laughing hysterically. He could not see his feet. There were, that's why I installed mirrors. So he could see his uh -huh. feet. They weren't on the originals. Well, and let me Dicko, just say. It goes a brilliant man, but he didn't think far ahead. Well, design-wise, but nobody, I guarantee you, he wasn't thinking too much no. about the internal workings of this stuff, no. but the fact that you did, uh, took yeah, a yeah. character that was silly and get, grounded it yeah. in some reality. Yeah. Pretty silly. I like, um, I, like, I like the angled feet, you know, the whoppy, the whoppy feet there that, that step on <laughs> thing. Well, I wanted to bring up Beetle too for a second because to me, uh. the Beetle character is, was always more about like he was a mechanic and this was sort of yeah. an off-the-shelf technology. This almost yeah. fulfills some of your low-tech Iron Man desires. Oh yeah. Oh, this was this was another tough one. This was another difficult one. Um, I cheated on the wings because um, we were nerdy kids. My best friend and I, James Sanders, and we were goofy kids. We we read there's a Robert Heinlein novel called *The Menace from Earth*, a short story, where uh, one of the ideas of Colonizing the moon would be a large bubble cave, uh, an old volcanic bubble, is turned into a place where you can fly with wings. And we were trying to figure out how those wings were designed. And this is what nerdy kids do on a Friday night. We get together with a bottle of soda and some cookies, and we drew all of this, all of the technical stuff to figure out this, the um, the exact pantograph uh, mechanism that might be needed. And I simply, I found that drawing again, and I sort of re uh, re revamped it a little bit, you know, 20 years later, whatever it was. Uh, 15 years later, and uh, made it made it better. Made it, and then I had to draw <laughs> had to draw it. But other than I mean, that, it, um, yeah, it's a backpack so. mounted ornithopter. Yes, exactly so. And, with the and, wings, with the wings traveling with a leading edge and a trailing edge, exactly in the pattern that's needed. Yeah, pain in the neck to figure that out. Beautiful stuff. Okay, Thank you. so this is the stuff. This is where. Now we're going to get into another one that was obviously a passion. And to be honest, I never made. The Iron Man, the Tony Stark, and Punisher connection being the the the, the lack of superpowers. But in hindsight, obviously that makes yeah. perfect sense. Yeah. I'm going to quickly kind of go through some of these because sure. this is some of your early earlier stuff um, from the handbooks yeah. on the Mark II armor, and this is where yeah. I go. You know, this outline of Iron Man was like, okay, yeah, all right, housekeeping yeah. computers. Fire suppression yeah. system. Yeah. Nobody really thought of that. But then you get into this helmet, and I'm going, this is a level of detail nobody was asking for, but I'm That's so true. glad that we have. It's well, amazing. I'm, I'm glad to hear that. that thank you. Yeah. yeah. Well, this, was, this is what made it fun for me, because, you know, Tony is the perfect fire and forget guy. You know, you turn it on and just use it. Well, there's, you know, that doesn't, that's like a car. We just want to turn the key and, and drive and get the gas. We don't want to think about anything. We had to set switches. We'd be, we'd be doing it forever. Same thing with all of this. So there had to be, there had to be something that made this work for him. And uh, that's what I hope that did. Uh, yeah. You yeah. Know, now uh, in recent years, there's all talks about like wearable computer computing sure. and personal sure. area networks and things like that, that I, I feel like, um, Kind of where the, this stuff just sort of yeah. presaged that a little bit. Well, what? what yeah, yeah. Um, the uh, the suit. The the only way the suit could have worked. The thing that the thing that gave me a clue. Um, I think it was. Uh, I don't know who drew it. It was a long time ago, where where the the suit material would come right down Tony's arm and join up with the glove. Yes. I, maybe it was Bob. Bob we're gonna go. We're gonna go into this for sure. Yeah. Because um, and I realized the only way to do that would be to have some kind of super duper extended area. I mean, if you you know the, if you if you use a fractal a fractal surface against a fractal surface, you get square miles in the in a in a small area. So if you have magnetic fields that can slide one across each other, like a flat motor, which is a, which was a thing at the time. Um, you could get more strength and more resistance out of it. Now, if you have force feedback with the motions of, of Tony and, you know, parenthetically, uh, Spitfire as well, then, or she didn't have that device. You know, 
Mr. Swen Professor Swenson didn't have that. Right. But they did have the feedback. If you move a little bit, you need a thing that can follow you very quickly to move a 600-pound you know, metal arm. And I'll let you in on a secret about Spitfire. Um, I hadn't figured out whether she was going to be sitting in there or standing. And it had to be a small person. So I was, I was looking forward to that diagram someday, but I didn't get to it. I wonder, just tangentially, what you thought of Brian Hitch's Iron Man designs in The Ultimates, if you've read that. I did not, uh, but I, I, I flipped through in a, on a comic stand no. Hey, competent illustrator. I mean, the thought, the thinking in that design, just tangentially, was to sort of mix Iron Man with like an F-16, right? Or, an, or, or like a fight. Iron Man was more like a fighter jet that you wore. Well, that's what, that's what the Iron Man costume is. Absolutely. And I loved having the supporting team. That's what I liked about Spitfire yeah. and the Troubleshooters. And I thought that's yeah. an idea that's worth exploring for an Iron well, Man I mean, character. my other best friend, uh, Paul Turgeon. He went to MIT and I visited him many times. And in fact, uh, when Jack and I were figuring out the book, we, Jack and I took a trip to Boston and photographed the camp just as well as I knew it back when I visited a few years before as a, when my friend was a college student. We were planning on setting this in the real world. We snuck into all the labs. So we're, you know, security is not what it is today. And uh, we just bounced around taking pictures of everything. And had a great time. I may, well, I may put out a portfolio of those pictures too. I'll say this: uh, the Iron Man, the, one of the concepts that was traditionally ridiculed about Iron Man was that he could fold this thing up and put it in his briefcase. Okay, uh, but but this your your ideas. I mean, because I know Stan wasn't thinking about it. He was just who whoever <laughs> came up with that concept. Was like, of course, a businessman carries his. I love Stanley, transistors. Yes, they're miraculous, but they only do a few things. Right. They can, they, you can get them to do a lot of things, but you can't get them to do what, what Stan did. But you know what? That didn't stop him. That didn't stop him at all. No, which not I, at all. I, I mean, I don't mean not to denigrate the guy at all. No, but no. what I'm saying oh, is, <laughs> what I'm do. saying is, I love, I, I love when you can take a corny old idea, but give it a modern spin that makes that doesn't disrespect the old idea that says, yeah, that really was right. He, I tried. Here's the details. Yeah, I tried. So you took this yeah. with Iron Man. Yeah. You yeah. took this to the, 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 the here's the, your original design of the suit tiles. Yep. And then later on, we'll, we'll talk about as you got into Iron Manual, you took this to the next level where you're talking, I, yeah. you're doing deep writing about the doping process on the I silicon tried. wafer yeah. layers and everything yeah. else. Yeah. T I, tell I, me a little I, bit about your, about the, the leap in technology between yeah. what you did in the handbook and the Iron Manual and, and how that manifested. I sort of understood uh, photolithography and its use in making uh, silicon circuitry, uh, integrated circuits. Printed circuit boards. Printed circuit boards. Uh, but actually, these were even smaller than that. Integrated circuits are the little black, you know. Sure, sure, sure. The little chips. The little black, the little black guys that are that are uh -huh. stuffed with components. Um, they're but they're miniature components. They're 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 very very small. And you can you know, hear you hear the story about packing a million transistors in there. Well, I was packing a million electric motors in there, and so that if you could control them, and that's really the trick of all of this stuff. If you control them, uh, you can get these motors to fit together in, a, in something that's three-eighths of an inch thick, half an inch thick, and it will stop a bullet because as the bullet starts touching it, it senses the motion, and if it's fast enough on a you know, micro, microsecond, uh, millisecond uh, a time frame, it will resist the bullet and stop it. So I and love you feel it. I love these concepts so much, and, and I feel like in modern sci-fi they've taken this thing called nanotechnology and turned oh, yeah. that in, that's magic now at this point right it, it, it's the trouble with it as of right now yeah um they're doing nanotechnology they've they've made micro motors sure made, of course uh, uh the the uh the gas chromatograph on a business card where you just put a drop of liquid or blood or anything on it and it settles out by itself and everything's figured out on a nanoscale level I 
only wish I had used the word nano once in the Iron Manual, and I had been a real genius. But otherwise, that page that you have up right now, I believe it's up right now, is uh, on the right, where the bacteria, um, that was what passed for nanoscale technology at the time, a metal affinity bacteria. This was a legitimate experiment that was going on that I'd read about in a science digest. Or something like that. And these guys had laid down circuit paths circuit boards with these guys, with these little micro, micro. And um, I, that's what I was trying to do, figure out how to make that work and make it look plausible. This is, this is beautiful stuff. And, and you, so, get, you, know, you get a suit. So thought provoking. And so like, man, this seems almost like, I, that, like this could be real. This is, this was. Well, it turns out there's better ways of doing that. <laughs> sure, sure. But the fact that you delved into not just the magical armor, but the, the machining process that would be required yeah. to create such a piece of technology yeah. is, again, something nobody else is doing, but L.A.R. Brown. Yeah, yeah. Actually, um, one, of the, one, of the, um, one of the nicest moments uh, recently is uh, a kid got in touch with me, I think through the, through the website, uh, elliotrbrown.com, and uh, uh, he said uh, he wanted to thank me because I had suggested something from the Iron Manual that he used to go on to get a degree in electrical engineering. It was some sort of one of the arms of the motion blur. And I thought that was, you know, I was glad mom was around to see that. that That's was, amazing. Yeah, so that was um, very sweet. I like that a lot. Good guy. Okay, so I want to talk about these two books together. These are sure. the Elliot R. Brown comics. These yeah. are the, these are, I mean, I believe Punisher Armory was first, right? Like the oh, yeah. first yeah. issue. And it, did the series complete before you did Iron Manual or was no. Iron Manual somewhere in the middle? Nope, somewhere in the middle. I think uh, I started Punisher in 92 and Iron yeah. Manual came out in 94. Right, okay. And I did, right. I had 10, uh, 10 armories, which is still amazing to me. I, well, because I'm going to say, the Iron Manual stuff, amazing. We just, like, we just went over it. But it, to okay. me, when I read it, it was flights of science fiction, science yeah. fancy in many ways. Very fun to read. Really, the most fun part of it was getting inside the mind of Tony Stark and how he approaches the iterations on it's the a, a, a little audacious, I thought, on my part to have written Tony Stark because, I mean, you know, his internal life must be extraordinarily dense. And I was, I had just been writing the Armory for a while, and I was, I was hoping to, hoping to pull back a little and, and focus on, on little things, not, you know, not killing people. Uh, maybe it worked. I don't know, really. Well, I haven't read it in a long time. I haven't reread it. I've always thought the, the, the idea that Tony is some super genius, like not quite yeah. Reed Richards or whatever, is, was not necessarily true. Like he was more of an applications guy. Like yeah, he well, wasn't well, a research well said. Yeah. guy. I've also got to thank uh, my buddy uh, Bill Sienkiewicz for, for doing the cover. Uh, that was very nice of him. It's genius. You know, I didn't, even real, I didn't even realize that it was him. Oh yeah, genius uh, for you know the, the update of Da Vinci's Measure of Man. Of course, and I just so so clever, and so very, well done too. Very much so. Yeah, really well done. Um, okay, that aside, yes. we're gonna leave flights of fantasy. We're gonna enter cold hard reality. Steel bullets. All right. Yes. So the Punisher, and it's interesting because I had a conversation with you earlier. We talked about TV adaptations of comics, and you mentioned something about you know the boys show yeah, and you yeah that it was a bit uh grim in its depiction of super heroics and what have you and i thought yeah. how ironic because <laughs> yeah that where did all this stuff really kind of begin uh but with the punisher at least that's the that's the accusation right that's the claim. yeah yeah um but so tell me tell me yes the the character of the punisher the, the man, right? He's, I want to know what he means to you and how he differs specifically, say, because what he is is Marvel's Batman. He's a realistic sure. Batman. That's how I saw it. That's exactly how I saw it, yeah. I love, okay. So we're on the also, I mean, wave right here. Tony Stark was Marvel's other Batman. You know, I mean, and, and Daredevil was yet another, was the real Batman, but that's a whole, whole <laughs> story. But um, so Punisher, yeah. completely ground in reality. It would have been really easy to give him some super weapons from S.H.I.E.L.D., you know, uh, or science yeah. fiction type stuff. But that didn't, that, you know, the, 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 the loner, 
uh, the, you know, the mad dog living underground, living on a, you know, in an old refrigerator um, box, uh, uh, you know, marshalling his, his weapons and his time and, and doing all the stakeout stuff you needed to do to get, to get a bead on your, on your enemy. Um, that, uh, that was more like the character that I could understand. Not yes. like Tony Stark, who's yes. much grander. Not like Batman, oh, pretty close to Batman, just not, you know, he didn't have the alter ego. Um, that's, you know, the public facade. He was, you know, the Punisher walked around, unlike the TV show, uh, you know, the Netflix series, um, you know, he, he, he covered up. He didn't want to stand out. Um, but uh, the character, uh, now, I, I don't approve of vigilanteism. I understand it uh, in the quest for some sort of answer to what the hell goes on in this world and the wheels of justice. Um, uh, you know, there are so many sides to lawsuits, lawyers, the police. Um, I'm a big defender of the police. Um, you know, when you, when you need a cop, nobody else will do. And on the other hand, policemen are just, these men and women are just people. They are people. They're well trained if you're lucky. They're following internal uh, logic and guidelines of their various departments. They often have uh, state and, and uh, local ordinances to keep in mind whenever they do stuff. So they are limited in what they can do. And there steps in the Punisher to finish up what they can't accomplish. Right. So well, that's it, what I believe is the character. Now, I don't, I don't approve of these things. I do I, I, nobody's yeah. saying that. I'm, I'm not right. trying to say that at all. No. Uh, and, no. and let me get this out of the way right up front. Yeah. That the Punisher Armory has been called many things, including like gun pornography, right? Yes, I tried very hard. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I think I, that's I an was... unfair. I think that's an unfair characterization, uh, and we're going to go into why. We'll no, go I don't into know about why. that. I well, if anything, done. it's an equipment uh, yeah. pornography, yeah. right? And okay, the so there were thirty-two write... pages, thirty-two pages of pinups in this in this book. No ads, which I thought was kind of interesting. Um, so it was all profit, you know, there was no, there was no, it only lived and died on, on how much money it made. And that was stupid. I wish they put ads in there. But what ads were you going to put in there? I, I don't know. <laughs> if, if the NRA and, you know, Field and Stream could have taken out ads, they would, that would have made sense to me. Or well, I've been lobbying for a collection of this stuff, of a collection of all uh, of your stuff. I'll tell, well, I don't know about all of it, but I'm certainly waiting for the 10 volumes to come out uh, because uh, that's a payday <laughs> and I yes. can use one. Um, I was shocked when they when they collected the uh, the Marvel Universe and all of its volumes. That was right. amazing. Okay, well, anyway, the problem so with this, this... Armory in my mind is the current political climate, and it, may, it would be a tough sell for a company like Disney to publish a book like that. I'm just gonna say, maybe, maybe, maybe. we'll see. Yeah. On the other hand, which we'll talk about, the yeah. book has many redeeming qualities. I mean, all redeeming qualities. In my mind, you write the Punisher like a law enforcement officer in many ways. Consciously, um, because I, I believe if you're gonna buy a gun, and I believe in every citizen's right to own and use a weapon, you should take all the training that a cop goes through because you are carrying a tool of deadly force. As much fun as you can have flinking away at targets, who knows when you're gonna be called on to use it to defend yourself, your family, your home, et cetera. And you should be trained when and where to use it. Should that be legally well, compelled, that training? I believe so. Yes, I believe it should be. A, you, you're given driving license. Why aren't you giving by, by I love law? Your, I, I, I can't find any fault with that argument. No, no, it's true. And, I, and my wife and I are considering weapons someday for fun. Well, I don't think we're so, going to be. You, wait a minute. Elliot, are you telling me Elliot R. Brown doesn't have a weapons locker behind him? And <laughs> They're all phony. They're all plastic. Amazing. They're all phony guns. No, it's okay, so. It's too expensive a hobby. It just well, is. That's, I want to. I'm going to get into some Punisher Armory pages. Here's a couple I took off the internet. Uh, yeah. And colored. Yeah. Um, right. These are out of the book. Um, the, right. the image on the and, left of the workshop. My yes. in-between job um, that led up to the Punisher Armory was working at a place called uh, Peter Wallach Enterprises. This was a wonderful uh, Lower Manhattan movie and TV show production studio. I was very lucky to get that. That was Larry Hama connection. I was so happy to get this job. A uh, very strange experience, lovely, a year out of my life. Um, I left because, uh, you know, the place was going crazy and it didn't have enough money. Um, and, uh, you know, the bosses were staring at everything. This is a pretty close depiction of the workshop that I ran. I was the shop foreman on it. So a little, a little neatened up and a little stylized, but that's it. And uh, I, it was a really, 
you know, I just, and this is one of those things where you did it, I did it straight from memory because I had so I was about to ask you, did you have photo reference for this? No, I didn't need it. I didn't need it for this. Um, I'm going to come back to this image in a second. It's in another slide. It's it's an important one to me. Yes, I think Um, so too. Yeah. uh, So what I wanted to point out was that beyond, uh, far beyond descriptions of weapons, and there's plenty of them. Absolutely. There's yes. plenty of descriptions of weapons and how they are chambered and the history of those weapons and yep. the history of the creators and how they were used. Amazingly researched, yep. done pretty history. thoroughly. Yeah, yeah. But there's I've also had, I had hundreds of magazines, uh, subscriptions to five or six magazines, including so, the weird machine gun news. I'll tell you, I must be on some watch list still. Um, <laughs> but I also bought books whenever I needed to because this was really before the internet was a thing. Um, in 92, 93, 94, was, and not that much of it digitized. And unless you were a scholar of the, of the material or you knew one weapon well or were taught, you had to go find the information. So I, I, I depended on the work of others, but I tried very hard to make it fresh. Well, the amount of research that had to go into every single page of, uh, yeah. of the Punisher Armory is, yeah. is, is, is pretty staggering and, to me. And hey, folks, if you ever need to draw an old flushometer toilet you got it right there that is the reference in in perfect perspective with a complete first aid with a complete first aid kit and frank castle's thoughts on state of the art of emergency first aid yeah and and like nobody thinks about why would the the punisher he's just like a crazy guy he's just thinking about ah see that's exactly what i thought there okay so when 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 okay so don i i'm 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 at peter wallach there was a, a, a layoff over the uh, New Year's, Christmas and New Year's uh, uh, holiday, uh, two weeks. So I did whatever I did. I went in, I walked into uh, uh, the office, the Marvel's office, and I sat down and yakking about this and that to everybody. Well, I just did this, I just did that. And and Don looks at me and, you know, Don's, Don's got these, you know, these icy blue eyes. He looks at me, he's the most important thing in the world. And he says, I need a technique. Um, I'm I'm Elliot, when you look, li- uh, uh, Elliot, I'm losing you a little bit when you oh, lean sorry. forward. Like, when you lean forward, <laughs> like, I leave okay. your mic a little bit. Uh, and he, <laughs> where's the microphone on this thing? Anyway, so he said, I was whispering, because that's what Don, Don always had a very quiet voice, oh, okay. very, very soulful voice. He said, I need a technical page. I've got this. Here's a, Carl Potts has this picture of a gun. He showed me this ridiculous gun. Uh, there was a machine pistol, a Czechoslovakian machine pistol or something like that. Uh, Polish machine pistol? I don't know what. And uh, he said, okay. So he says, and it's for the Punisher War Journal. Well, I didn't know what that meant at the time. I'd only known the Punisher. I, while I was sleeping, they had come up with five or six other titles for the Punisher. But I didn't know that. I didn't even see it on the walls. Um, this was the War Journal. I thought it was his personal diary. So if you ever see that first page, you'll see that it's, it's silent. He, I didn't know what to say about it. The gun's propped up, and there's targets where the gun, you know, was, he was testing it for spread over, over range, and uh, took notes and handwritten notes, and it, there was a, a, a filing cabinet with some information that they'd all been lab- neatly labeled and organized, because I believe that the Punisher Armory should be an answer book to the regular run of crazy comic cardboard characterization. You don't just pick up any old gun and start blinking away. You actually have to train. You have to, you have to know what you're doing. So he was a competent technician as well as a competent shooter. You don't become a competent shooter by sleeping around eating potato chips and watching TV. You have to be out on the street and practicing. Right. Yeah, exa- well, that was my point. You went into, yeah. but besides stuff like, like here, I'm showing some, like on the left, like a very like s- yeah. high tech weapon, yeah. rare weapon. Well, You're it's not it's amazing it. how, how old this gun is. Yes, this, that's a P90, which is a, you know, the, uh, a Belgian arms uh, the bullpup design, it's still out there. You'll see them in, in modern movies and TV shows. They're, they're can I just say, I, I, I love the fact of how much, because everybody in the world must assume that Elliot R. Brown is sitting right now cleaning his guns somewhere, right? <laughs> like, they have to assume that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And if I, if, I, if I were that person, I'd be just like the Punisher, because it's an all-consuming passion. You fire a gun, you have to clean it. Well, right. Well, so here's an yeah. example, right? Here's some yeah. examples of working on the sights and yes and yes. balancing and the, the the amount of maintenance work the how much right. time is the punisher spending like with bluing and his guns as much as it needs 
And that's the whole point. This guy, this guy was driven. If he's got to deal death, he wants to make sure he's not the one getting the getting the, the, the return fire. He's right. got to take out the target. He's got to be he's the avenging force that can't be shouldn't be stopped if he can do anything about it. Well, so, and yeah. then and then I love this stuff where it was like it's not enough. He's not just fixing guns and tra- he needs training scenarios. That's right. That put him in a real unusual system. situations. I didn't make this up. This is a real system that was stole back in the day. Sure. I, I mean, I assume when I read this that every single thing in here was real. I mean, it just has that air of reality. Couple of ringers. Couple of ringers. Um, there was a, a walking, a stair walking robot that I did when I was in the hospital. Uh, there was, uh, and actually, I did it in ballpoint pen, so it was pretty cheesy looking. But you know, shrink it down, you clean it up, everything was fine. Um, there was a. Uh, uh, a, a, a drone, an early. I, uh, I, I an believe early I have a picture of that drone. Oh, okay. I, I think I had. I know I looked at it. Um, and I, and I also, you know, and those were the days when you could just get all kinds of stuff. That was a real. Yeah, um, yeah there, so there's there was the it. drone. Yeah, yeah, that's it. And isn't it funny how this is this? I don't know how. It's hard to tell how big it's supposed to be in in this picture. Uh, it's it's big because you're right. Uh, it looks like a space. I mean, just based on the camera lens, there, it seems like it's big. The military actually had something that looked a lot like that that had been around for about 10 years. So it's, it was, once again, it was based on a real design yeah. because I didn't feel like I should be designing stuff like that. Um, but I tried. And also making it stereo. That was something I did. Well, uh, I went to a wedding. I went to a wedding oh, yeah. this weekend, right? And there yeah. was a drone taking amazing footage in a, yep. a driven off a guy's cell phone. And yep. when you Drones think about- have come a long way. Yes, they have. Well, this was, yeah, I made up that control set. It, you know, it was all radio controlled, you know, from the good old days. So I just wanted to quickly oh, yeah. t- touch on a couple of these things here that, sure. like, um, I hate bricks. I hate uh, like, wood. I so hate... obviously you're into photography. We know that. So obviously there's drastic surveillance. If the, if the Punisher was not aware of what went into a good photograph, then certainly microchip was. Right. So that was, that was important to me that, it, that it became, at least we know what's out there. Uh, when he's holding up a big camera, well, he's obviously got a room full of lenses and bodies and, and stuff lying around because you have to. And he must know about exposures and he must, and he's not taking it to the photo mat to develop it, right? He, he's yeah, got to he have does. his own darkroom facilities, a absolutely. lab facility. Yep, absolutely. And um, then and this I'm, a huge lock, I'm a huge lock picking fan. I as well. So I also, these were the good old days. You could just send away and get lock picking sets. You could just buy everything you ever wanted to pick locks. Get, I, I, I still have a couple of pick sets lying around. In fact, I set one up and, and bought a lock. And, you know, I made sure the whole family was trained. And on rare occasion, I have used it in the real world. Um, there was one time we were trapped in Marvel uh, late at night. And somebody said, well, you know, that closet's never been opened. What are you talking about? It's been like, yeah, somebody lost a key like three, four years ago. Yeah. Come on. So I, I picked the lock. And inside was Mori Kuramoto's uh, raincoat, winter coat, and uh, um, a sweater that Virginia Romita had lost. <laughs> so, so I, so, and that was with the that was the, the permission of the editor in chief at that point, sure. Bob Harris. Dear, good old I Bob. had similar experiences at work with file cabinets. They lost the keys exactly. to right, like exactly. And yes. the fact that you can be treated like a criminal for possessing a tool, like a legitimately useful tool. How do you well, feel about that? Um. It's all circumstances, and it also depends on the cop. It also depends on the time of day and what you're doing. And and I I hate to say it, but you know where you are and what is the color of your skin. Um, you know these these are all issues that are probably not germane to a comic book uh, discussion. But the point is, if you know if you're going to carry a pick set around, make sure you carry one of the. Well, and what shirts. you mean by just to clarify that, what you mean by is that you might expect different treatment depending on the color. Oh of yeah, your skin oh yeah. I, I mean, I've heard. I'm applying. Um, I happen to know that if you if you're it's you're not supposed to carry a, a Swiss Army knife around with a blade longer than two and three quarter inches. However, if it's three inches, it's a quarter inch. If it's two and a half, it's a it's a quarter inch under. Right. But if a cop doesn't like what you're wearing, or he has had a bad day, he or she has had a bad day, you can have wow. that. Uh, you can have it confiscated. You can get a ticket. You can get a uh, you know bench appearance warrant. So you can get all kinds of weird things. It all depends on the time of day and the cop. Uh, Believe me, as somebody with a, as somebody with an Arab surname, if I grow my beard out, I I can expect. Could happen. Yeah. 
yeah. like it a or real not. Extra scrutiny. Yeah, yeah. Which is you know. Um, okay, so I, I just going to quickly go over that. How much more sure. than guns was in the Punisher armory? Because right. if it was all guns, I would have lost interest in it. Because I'm not a gun guy either. I'm not a gun nut. Well, I'll tell you, I felt constrained by the type of weaponry the Punisher used. Uh, small, uh, large bore, uh, rapid fire, big guns. And there's only a few of those. You know, I mean, uh, he's not going to carry around military ordnance all the time. You can't, you can't run a howitzer down the street. So I eventually, it was very hard to find good photo reference of, of things back in 1993, 94. I did the best I could, but I, I get bored. Now, one year, I, I did a page where I had, uh, I had shown a Kessel, um, uh, somebody, somebody redid the, the, the cylinder uh, from a six shot to a seven shot by redoing the machining. And I'd done it a page and I talked it up and the guy who represented the, that fellow, that machinist came into the office and said, Hey, what are you doing? Where is this guy? He turned to be a great guy. He got me in touch with, um, he was an old, uh, uh ex state trooper, uh, Andrew Palmerton. And, uh, I, I thank him in the credits of the armor. And, uh, uh, he got me connected with the strategic weapons and tactics expo. In California, oh. in 1993, I went out there. My wife and I drove across country, stayed there in California for a long time, went to the expo, picked up every scrap. I saw I saw familiar things. I, I greeted these people like long lost brothers. I said, well, how do you know about it? I drew a comic book. And they're looking. Yeah, a comic book. Anyway, I did that. Um, and I learned about all this extra stuff because I built, okay, here's my, here's the standard wrap. <clears throat> Give me the standard wrap. I got, I got, I got tired of doing guns myself. Guns are a pain in the neck to get right. I hate, I hate checkering. I hate, I hate strip checkering like with a passion. I got good at it for about 10 minutes and ever, as you can see before, when I worked up to it, I got good and then I got bad. And, and you can always tell, it, just, it, it always, it always got, um, bricks. I hate bricks. I hate brick walls. I hate, uh, uh tiling. I hate all kinds of stuff. I don't, okay. So as soon as I could, I saw, I, 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 whatever, you know, gun magazine, I'd scratch it out and write anything else, firefighters, secret agent stuff, police forensics, anything else that was interesting that I could possibly stuff in. Uh, and that, I think that made not just the book more well-rounded, but the character. Of the character. Okay. Castle. This is where I want to come back yeah. to now. Okay. I want to. I want to end up our our our, our okay. Punisher conversation for a second, then we'll we'll, uh, we'll we'll wrap it up soon. But I wanted sure. to show. Um, this is what, how we how we doing for time? You all right? We got as much time as we want in this internet age, <laughs> okay. my friend. So okay. I guess it's true. Yes. And I go can ahead. chop this thing up if I need to, but I don't want to. But okay, um, go ahead. This image. So this was the last page of the second issue. Yeah. Of the Punisher uh, Armory. It had the caption boxes, which, by the way, I think you told me you typed up and pasted down, like from yeah. a typewriter. Yeah, we did that. We had a specialized typewriter, and uh, we put it all together ourselves. Yeah, and okay. so I'm not going to read the copy from this. It's it, it is it's it, it's poignant without being um, sappy. Like days. it it touches. Oh no no, this is sappy. No, no, no. I can still get worked up over this one. Well, I mean, it's poignant, I believe, but like you could have went schmaltzy. You could have went sap, a lot sappier on yeah. the, oh my, my. So the, the idea here is that this is the toy pistol of the Punisher's deceased son. Yep. And he says he pulls it out every once in a while and he uses it. Motivate. And when you say that he uses it, are you trying to imply that he uses the, the memory, the Please tell me what you mean. That's exactly right. You see it. You see it exactly. It's in the. It's in the. It's in the dialogue. It's in the within the thought caption. Um, this is, this is the reason why the Punisher does what he does. Very simple, because his family was murdered, and it was a complete, you know, a complete nightmare, a waking nightmare, any any parent's nightmare. By the time I did this, I think my son was two, and I felt very deeply about this. Um. At this point, you know, mercifully enough time has gone by, the wife and I can laugh about this because if you just if you read it, read out some of the, the, the text and pretend to be crying and you can you can make yourself laugh pretty easily. But it's it it was really it's still moving stuff. I got everybody in the office crying. I, I mean because 
because it is moving and but the way you Thank phrased you. it was subtle enough yeah. that it was not yeah. it ran true. and i use it well listen you know i mean frank castle is a human being and he may be he may be broken he may be scarred he may be um warped but taking life uh you know if, no matter how richly it deserves to be taken is not an easy thing for anybody ultimately well, I mean, he's a mass murderer. He's a, yes. he killed hundreds yes. of people without due process and what have you. But they were all bad. Absolutely. Absolutely. And this is it. This is, this is, this is the justice for his, uh, his murdered child. In, yeah. in a desktop image. Okay, so that was meaningful to me. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, that was, a, that was a turning point for me. Okay, um, not long after work, uh, Oh, I'm sorry. Not, not long first. after working on Punisher Armory, um, you didn't work at Marvel anymore. Do you want to just tell us the circumstances? Oh, yeah. Oh, happened? no. Marvel, Marvel went through uh, its own changes. Uh, in 1989, before, before any of this, Marvel had been bought by uh, the, uh, Ron Perlman. Per, yeah, Perlman. The McAndrews and Forbes group. The Toy Biz guy. And the, who ultimately it turned into the Toy Biz guy. Well, that was, a, that was a different person. But they all got together. And the point was that one would support the other, the toys would support the office and the office would support the toys. Because the trouble was, um, um, when they bought Marvel, they, they pretty much uh, got rid of the distribution. They wanted to buy the distributor. So they yes. bought the number three distributor in the country. Heroes And then they World. fired everybody. Yeah, Heroes World. And they fired everybody and kept their own people in. In fact, Ivan Snyder, I believe, was one of the people who came back to run Hero, or what was Heroes World. And, uh, I, by the way, I was working in a comic shop at during this time, that time. So like we, f I, I felt the ramifications of this stuff for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what now, actually, I'd love to hear your reaction from the other side of the counter. Um, I, all I know is the years that we didn't know what was going on. We're out in the field. We're doing our homes, doing our stuff. We don't know what's going on. All of a sudden we, you know, your book's canceled. You, you stop what you're doing, uh, hand in your last page and we're all done here. And then your editor's fired. And so, you know, you can't get his phone. You can't get him on the phone. Um, that's all we knew. It worked right up. What was happening was, uh, years later, we figure it out. And I, I recommend anyone go buy Comic Wars. And then the, the next thing you do is get the, uh, Sean Howe's book, um, uh, The Untold Story of Marvel, or something like that. A uh, great book, two great books, which finally tell you what happened. And um, uh, uh, all I knew is there were 6,000 direct comic shops in around that time, 1989 to 90, 91. Coast to coast in Hawaii, and then all of a sudden, we're down to 600, 100 comic shops, direct market shops. Now, I don't know, I mean, when I say the direct market, that should be gone into too at some point, because um, there used to be newsstands, and there used to be direct comic shops. Sure, Phil uh, Suling, the direct that's, market revolution. That's all of, right, that's exactly right. And, but it's, it's hard to explain that distinction to the, the buying public. Right. Um, basically, a newsstand could sometimes have a comic book, but there was a whole system of returns. Yes. You know, even if you, if, you don't, if you get five newspapers and you sell four, you can send one back, you get credit for the next day. Same thing with a comic book. Every month, if you, if you get 10, you sell four, you can send six back and get credit for the next day. Uh, you, you, we all, we're all familiar with the torn off covers, and that's where that came from. Um, and and the you know the, the, the rip off of having to destroy the comic book when sure. you put it and sell it a year later. Anyway, that's a whole different story. Not that you well, did well, that. Well, the, the direct market, yeah, de where, dealt. But the direct uh, market traded returnability for a larger discount. Exactly. And exclusivity of certain items, right? Exactly. So, yes. Um, and it was that it was the larger discount, and that and and the worst part was. So I I I I, I would hold up. X-Men number one as the prime example of how excess Jim Lee's X-Men number one. Jim Lee's X-Men. Now, Jim, love the man. He's, a, he's another brilliant guy. He did very well. Love him. Did the, did the first cover on my book on, on X-Men. Uh, yeah. On, on, on or, uh, Armor, Armory, Armory number one. Right. Um, and I'm grateful to that. because you know, We went back and forth about that stupid thing he was waving. I'm going to do a whole page on that gun, which was a grenade launcher, believe it or not. <laughs> that was that was mounted to a separate lawn, you know, taken off the gun and stuck on its own on its own uh, receiver. Anyway, um, took me years to find it. He just saw it in a book. Now draw that. All right, all right, all right, okay, okay. So, uh, <clears throat> um, uh, okay, no so 
Oh, right. keep going. I'm sorry. No, I, I'm keep sorry. Going. I didn't mean to interrupt. But so, like, I what I wanted to say was the the um, you had. I we're getting to the point where you departed from Marvel as a full time staffer. Oh yeah. Okay. Well, I just I went freelance. I I could I could I made money. I, I did very well. Those were some of the best my best years. Oh, I, I often say I would have I would have killed for another ten Marvel reports. I did ten. I would have loved another ten. I would have settled for four. I mean, I almost anything at that point. Um, because uh, there was nothing. I, I uh, oh, I was going to point out that you know the, the 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 excess was what what blew up the market was the stores were felt compelled to buy special uh, enhanced covers and gimmicks. Um, uh, the X Men number one was uh, one of the one of the most successful comics ever sold because it was one interior and five covers. Four covers were different, and then those four covers were banged together into a fifth cover that was a double gatefold. And all of those had to be sold. And of course, top dollar, comic shops wanted every one of them, so they'd got thousands of them. They'd stack the boxes up to the ceiling and, and hopefully sell them all. They never sold them all. Because well, when I bought the comic shop that I worked in as a kid, I started working in a comic shop when I was 11. Through high school, X Men yeah. number one came out. The boss was ready. He bought yeah. cases and cases. Yeah. Fifteen yeah. years later or so, I bought that store and I had pristine, filled cases of X Men number one. But you know what? Right. I could sell those things for cover price all day long, and the cover price was higher than it was almost a modern day cover price. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's funny how things have come around because now it's a curiosity, but at the time it destroyed me. Okay. Because everybody wanted a number one. Of course. Everybody wanted, everybody wanted a number one and a, an enhanced cover. They wanted the die cut cardboard cover. They wanted the glow in the dark embossed cover. And God bless them. I love that. But Marvel hadn't done their homework. Well, and then that stuff sure. hitting so big at Marvel yeah. led to the image revolution <laughs> and led to yeah. well, they, many they, great they, things, really. Creators' rights, yeah. and royalties, and many other good things. They're still a little sketchy on royalties. And they the, um, it was called incentive for a reason, and often the office cheated a little bit. I mean, my my comrade Carl Potts, uh, famous editor and creator at Marvel, he said, you know, every time you bring a lawyer and an accountant and check the books, they find that they hadn't given him enough money. <laughs> so uh, that was that's that that's doesn't funny surprise thing. me at all. Nah, not really. No. Okay. No. I mean, it's a shame, but still. But so, we okay. left Marvel and we went on to greener pastures as a freelancer. And um, it seemed that way, but my unfortunate, and I did, I did a couple of bits for, for, uh, for DC. DC. DC didn't seem to know what to do with me exactly. Um, you know, Mike, my buddy Mike Carlin and a lot of the office guys, uh, Denny O'Neill and Archie were over there. And I, got, I did get work. This is one of the standout pieces, um, the, the Gotham okay. City map. Can I say the fact that they didn't just snap you up as a full timer immediately, or at least make you an offer, is a pretty short sighted on their part? Uh, well, I happen to agree, and thank you for saying that. But the truth is, they were running; they were running on empty at the same at the same time. The whole industry had had contracted by ninety. This was ninety nine. Um, you know, Marvel had gone bankrupt by that point, ninety eight, ninety nine, something like that, and that tended to drag the entire industry down. Some say DC saved the industry by going exclusive to Diamond Comics and, and, and keeping it alive. They had no choice. They had no choice. Right. There's no well, other way to do it. Speaking of choices, I wanted yeah. to bring this map up because I... <clears throat> sure. This was really interesting to me. The most interesting thing, this is, comes from your website, these two different pictures. And one sure. is yes. the, the stuff in red is stuff that you added. And you were very specific about mentioning this, both here and in the Smithsonian article. Yes. And that... Nobody pointed out exactly what a cool contribution this was, in particular to me, taking Gotham Park and renaming it Robinson Park ah. shows a respect yeah. and a knowledge of history of, of Batman's creators. Absolutely. Uh, that, that obviously DC didn't even have. And but but they picked up on it. That may have been a that may have been a contribution by, by one of the uh, uh, other editors. Uh, I think uh, because you know, I actually I went in and I and I I took notes, but I think I may have done. You know, it's hard to. It, you know. It's okay, well, that's time, generous of you to say. That's generous of you I, to say I'm, for sure. I'm pretty sure. Well, they gave me a lot of ideas, but I did. I wanted it to be Archie. You know, a, an Archie Airport, and uh, 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 I may have I may have put the Robinson Park in myself. But Ellie, as the as the artifacts stand, 
this is yours. So you let's <laughs> okay, I, you may, I probably, yes. What I want to say, though, is that that was adopted among some of the changes. Your general um, adaptation of changing sort of, this is a, a, a mutation of Manhattan. Yeah, of the five boroughs, actually. I, I only wish I could have made it physically larger in, mm -hmm. in proportion. Um, um, if I'd made it as large as New York City, you know, I would have, I'd still be growing it. So I, I'm so, glad I, I stuffed it in. And, I, you know, the, and the reality of, of doing a, a map uh, for something like, I mean, even, I mean, even Marvel, um, or, but certainly DC, um, they didn't, none of the artists wanted to be constrained. Um, the, the beauty part about, about New York City, the five boroughs pretty much represent anything you need. I mean, short of a desert with infinite horizons, you've got jungle, you've got you know, rivers and lakes and zoos and museums and back alleys galore right. and the right. docks all over the place. So that's what I was sort of aiming for here. You could, you could, you could set direct anything you needed. Um, I the and last well, speaking the of last set, right? Oh, and yeah, this, speaking of this was mentioned in the Smithsonian article who profiled you as the cartographer of Gotham City. Yeah, well, yes, yeah, that, 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 I, I did. I'm, just, I'm just quoting the headlines of major national publications. Thank Elliot. you. Yes, it's, that's all that's necessary. Thank you. And they pointed out that, um, you know, this was used in some of the Batman films as like the basis for their transit I know. map. I know. I, 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 would like, I would like two things. I would like a print of that subway map, but I'd also like to know how much that guy was paid. Totally. Yeah, and why are they not hiring ERB? Well, just because I'm a student of, you know, maps in the subway system. Well, I, I really love this, this type of design, like the London tube-based design yeah. Uh, yeah. on maps. Well, that's actually an old, that's an old New York City map style. When it, went, when it first went, uh, ah, uh, they, yeah. they straightened it up a little bit. Um, the old maps were very, which more, were more like map maps, and this was more stylized. To, uh, well, to show you. I, I just wanted to point out, though, that they did lose Robinson Park, and it went back to Gotham Park or Gotham West Park. Yeah. Hey, you know what? The office guys weren't paying attention. To what they <laughs> um, and I went in here, yeah, the South, South City Park they turned it into. Yeah. Here, this is a little detail of. And that's I, actually, I, I, wanted, I didn't know. really it, nice. This is, is this, this, this is in the style of the geodetic survey, you know, the USGS. Yeah. I, I grew up on those maps of, of New York City. I have you seen, where did this one come from? Oh, piece of heck out of me. This could have been um, Gotham. I think they may have had a Gotham ah. uh, map that was on the wall. And somebody handed it over at some point. There was a quick shot of it. So they had a, map, a real map done. No, not a real map, but they had a map that was um, in the style of real maps. Although the USGS stuff, you kind of have to be a, a fan of maps to really appreciate that stuff. Um, there's a lot more um, removed from, from reality maps that, are, that would, be a, would have been a better source for a general print. Um, that's pretty specific. You, you want, you what, to bring that, that layer of reality, even another yes. layer of reality, yes, really? Layer, yeah. yeah, well, I couldn't. I didn't, who, who's got the time to draw like that? I, I didn't have that. <laughs> I okay, mean, I well, love. I love the work, but I had to get it done too. So, I mean, in your freelance period, I saw you did work for Wildstorm. You did yes. a really beautiful Legion of Superheroes. Yes, um, I, I was still doing. I did um, a lot of buddies went to different companies. I was very happy to get calls from them. Um, uh, the DC stuff is still. I'm very proud of a lot of the DC stuff. A lot of the DC stuff seemed like really they didn't need to call me to do. But it was nice of them to do so. Some of the stairs, like, there was a giant map of the world that kind of bothered me. It was a little spread there uh, for my involvement. But it was, I, I wasn't going to turn them down um, and, or criticize their choices because, uh, you know, I needed the money. And uh, uh, I, I was very kind. And my buddy Carlin got me a uh, Doc Savage, Fortress of Solitude, which is another one of my childhood influences. I love Doc Savage. Crazy for the, for the character and for, the, for the, the time in which it was set. And I did the best I could to make it as real as, well, as I could. I, I, Elliot, I'm not kind of out of this material here, but this is where I wanted to talk to you. I want to know about, we, now we know about the past of Elliot R. Brown. You seem like a really sharp guy still. I, like, well, I want to see more Elliot R. Brown. I want to see Elliot R. Brown draw uh, Sherlock Holmes's uh, headquarters. I want to see Elliot wow. R. Brown draw Doc Savage's headquarters. I want to yeah, see the so shadows I. underground lair through the filter yes. of Elliot R. Brown. Have you ever considered or thought about 
self-publishing, kickstarting, or, or pitching to a real publisher because with the photos that you have alone of the Marvel bullpen, combined with just the years of amazing, unparalleled work. I say that in the sense that there's nothing else like your work really out there so at that level. Certainly not the body of work, yeah. I mean, I've I seen mean, a couple of shots that were pretty well, good. Well, closest couple of things. You know, there's some of those cross-section books. I don't yeah. know, Stephen Beastie and things yeah. like that. Oh, yeah, I know him. I, I actually sent a, uh, I sent a Star Wars piece off to one of them. They, they didn't, that didn't work out for him. Um, that's, that surprises and shocks me. The other thing, though, I found something I've been interested in years, for years, and I wonder if you What's are. What's that? What's that? You ever What's read, that? do you ever see PS Magazine? No. Okay. What this was this? Preventive Maintenance Monthly. <laughs> okay? This was uh-huh. a comic magazine yeah. about maintenance procedures oh, drawn that. by Will Eisner. Well, I knew the, I didn't know it was the name PS Magazine, but I know the Eisner work, yeah. Right, so he, it's been collected. There's a hardcover book that collects it. Excellent. Okay. Some of it. I can't wait to see it. And 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 I found these at a local bookstore here in my in my area. Some of these actual magazines you can find them for like a buck or something because anywhere okay. with a lot of military people, right, right, they might have it. And inside here, I just wanted to real quickly. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Okay, and Will Eisner art directed this. I don't think he did those drawings, but he certainly right. did the covers. Absolutely. And a lot of the internal work. And it was the closest. I mean, it's not huh. a parallel. It's not exactly, but it's the closest thing that I could find. I've seen, I, I, I spent way too much time looking in technical libraries, staring at everything, everything. Well, I believe it, and it shows. It, and I know that style. Now, you know, a lot of those, a lot of those are are um, drawn over industrial pictures, which was a thing back in the day, where you would you would actually take a print, a photographic print, and you would lay on the coloring, oh. that, you know, I mean, ink, and different and different in different colors, and you'd photograph them. I see through a uh, through a filter, and all the black and white would go away, and you just have the artwork left. And so you could you could do actually perfect perspective and you know exactly what the thing looked like. Yeah, those were the days. Oh, so Russo the other thing I've talked about. to you earlier about is you yes. know do you do commissions or do you sell original artwork? I I do not do commissions. I have not yet started commissions. The trouble was it was it was tough enough doing those on a deadline and for a pretty good page rate. It's hard. It's I don't I. I would spin this around if I didn't make it pretty dizzy and show you how, what little room I have to work with. And I would, right. I would, if I if I had to restart drawing again, the few the few things I have done in the last ten years, I've done on a laptop, and it was a big job. It was a, it was a physically demanding. I, I want. So I wanted to ask though about modern. To- has Elliot R. Brown used computer aided drafting tools at all? Th- there's I, a program I wanted no. to recommend to you. Yes from Google called SketchUp. Yes. I looked at, I was. Because I thought like, in the like hands this. of somebody like you. Yes, maybe. You could very quickly produce very amazing work in SketchUp that could be exported and used in a variety of, of, of ways. I've been, I've, been, I've been thinking. I was, I wanted to try 3D printing. So I got 123D and I used that instead of SketchUp. Because the, men, the menus look less challenging. Uh, it turned out my, my Windows 7 machine was dying and it was made for Windows 10 and you know, wow. blah, blah, blah. And I was, yeah. I was fighting the program after a while. So I got very unhappy until like, you know, years later, somebody said, oh, you could have used that on a Windows 10 machine. <laughs> Thank you so much. And so um, I've, had my, I've had my experience um, to, you know, lap this back to a little bit. Back at MIT, when my buddy was, was attending this, 1974, I saw the architecture machine, which was exactly what you're suggesting. It was an original version where the, mach- the, the, the computer was only the size of a, uh, a Murphy bed. And uh, um, if you moved a dimension, all the other dimensions would, would change around it. So that's, you know, I, that was pretty mind blowing. And I realized it was a thing in the future, but then you know, a 25 megahertz computer was the cutting edge, but it would only take an hour to render a, an eight and a half by seven page. Sure. So, you know, those were, and then by that time, it's hard. 
the last thing I need to do is learn more systems. One more system. I can, I, can bear, I can make my way through Illustrator and Photoshop using a tenth of what it's capable of. And it's already a strain. So SketchUp, I took a look at SketchUp. I took a look at Tinkercad. I took a look at a couple of them. And I tried using them. I actually downloaded them and I tried to make them work. And every and like like a lot of software, like a lot of software, they have the same function, but they must give a different name. To of course. Them. Often it's a name that we use conversionally and other things, and we know what it means. But in this case, it means something else. And then they use a similar uh, concept in the index program. So I found that I found that more intrusive on my peace of mind than uh, than is healthy. And so I haven't haven't said yes yet. Um, Very interesting. I'm, but I'm not, I'm not saying no, because if I am going to get into 3D printing, I really should. As far as original artwork, I don't think I have enough original artwork to sell much. Um, and I only say that I've only got, I've got the 10 Armory books. I've got the Iron Manual. So that's, that's you know, 320 pages and uh, a 32 page, another, another 32 page book. And the G.I. Joe, Order of Battle, and... Uh, you know that horrible baby don't smoke comic book I did. <laughs> you know, it's not. I I did I did the freelance. I did the thing after I, I went to work for um, uh, Penthouse Comics, uh, Penthouse Magazine. Oh, okay. Uh, and, you know, uh, George uh, Carrigan had done uh, some great work at Marvel, and when he started that up, he said, "I should have Elliot Brown work for me." And I was very happy to do that for a little while. That ended badly, but still, it was an interesting experience. Um, I got a lot of freelance out of that. Something else I'm going to be putting up on elliotrbrown.com um, and talking about. Let me, um, um, well, before we go to, let me show okay. one more time elliotrbrown.com. Uh, go right ahead. Thank you. Uh, let's see what we got here. Uh, I've got, uh, here we go. So the other thing I wanted to point out, I don't know if you've seen this, Elliot. Um, your website Wonderful. I know your wife has worked on this, who, by yes. the way, is the night one of the nicest people I've ever met. She's what she, made this interview happen. That's right. I appreciate She's that. the mover and shaker she that is. made this thing happen. Yes. I, I behind, love it. Behind every great man stands a greater woman. Well, it's true. I, not, ain't it the truth, brother? A patient, a patient and tolerant woman who, who puts up with your, your junk. I got one of those two. I got one of those two who puts up with my interviews and my comic <laughs> yeah. book videos and everything else. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But I wanted to point out that yes. like as much detail as you gave today, and we talked about a lot of cool things. You've got amazing details in this in this website. It's written in a really engaging style. It's fun to that. read. Thank you. Talks That's about history nice. of the bullpen. If you're a deep Marvel comics nerd like myself, you're gonna find endless hours of of interesting stuff on here. That's nice of you to say. I appreciate that. Because, you know, I'm sitting up here in, in, the, in the, you know, the wilderness and not really getting, I mean, you know, and yes, everybody who was there reads it and they say, hey, nice. I remember that. And, you know, I don't know where it else, where else it leads. But. And I also wanted to point out this website when I looked for your stuff. Yeah. My son found this. I thought that was a riot. This is on Tumblr. Yeah. Love and I, it's, it's so well organized. I, I was worried that maybe you would be not happy with it. But oh, wow. frankly, great. it is, that's where I got most, a lot of my images that I didn't get from your website came here. You can go through. Oh yeah, you can, look at that. You, yeah. can zoom, you can zoom in. We can get into, we can actually read the text that's going on oh, here. Oh boy, yeah. I actually had to write that. It, it, it's an amazing resource. It has like all of the key stuff that I remember. I'm sure there's stuff yeah. missing. Oh, um, it's hard to get it all. I mean, there's a lot of little stuff thrown in. But I wanted to point it out and I just wanted to, yeah. um, yeah, nice. That's, yeah, that was a very nice uh, discovery. I, I enjoyed that. I, and I, I, well, I just wanted to say thank you so much for making this time. You didn't have to do this. I, and I, uh, I truly no, no. You know what? I don't get to talk much. I mean, I, the people I talk to are already you know, in the business or my, my buddies who are, you know, they're, we're all hanging out in the dark with our tongues hanging out our heads looking for the next job. And so it's nice to talk to somebody uh, with a fresh attitude. It, 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 uh, you know, it'll, uh, exposure never hurt anybody but well yeah. i feel like we've got a crossover of interest in technology and yeah. comics and things that 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 um is why I, since literally since i've a kid been a kid i've wanted to talk to you and this is oh, like wow. a, dream, a dream come true happy this is to do it by far uh the most exciting interview i've been able to uh <laughs> make now, wait a minute <laughs> i would love I, I would love to invite you back anytime if you ever want to talk about 
anything in particular or in general? Give you, a call, brother. I got. I will. We started and stopped half a dozen conversations. We could. I could go on. I know we did, and I would love to come back and revisit. Maybe go into deeper detail on some of the stuff, like maybe just about official handbook and the different sure. volume. We didn't even talk about some of the things I wanted to talk about there, like the the look, the fact that there were no ads, the fact that. You revealed yeah. to me that all of the character sketches, while drawn by different artists, were inked by the same artist, yep. by the same inker, yep. Yep. which Rubin's to me yep. answered the question of why that book looks so good and following volumes did not look yep. as consistent and as good. Well, yeah, because Mark was no longer there. You know, Mark had, Mark had actually, uh, before Mark died, he had handed the book off to other editors who were younger, less experienced. Um, Mark was a driven man, and I, I you know, one of the things, I mean, his ability to zero in on details and stay there for weeks at a time was very uh, inspiring. And uh, that's really how we got through that project. That was a big, big project. Well, I, it, it was amazing. Soul. It was seminal. It was lasting. It's something that has made an impression yeah. on, I'm going to say, millions of people, whether well, they know it or not. Well, let's put it this way. They call the movies Marvel Universe for a reason. You know, you're not wrong. Yeah. I never even put that together. Yeah, um, that's Grunewald. That's, that's Grunewald. So, so, Elliot, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, for thank being you. Here. We'll, this is, this I hope is, uh, we'll get to is, talk again soon, but... I'm sure we will. Thank you for your time. Especially now that I understand this crazy video system.